and I'm going to pull up my Zoom to make sure that um, we are, so we've got 19 people with us on Zoom. We have many people here with us in council chambers. I want to welcome everybody um, in person and remotely. This is the Portland City Council. We're in a regular meeting tonight, and I will call this meeting to order. Please join me, if you will, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Fournier? Here. Councilor Rodriguez? Here. Councilor Dion? Here. Councilor Ali? Here. Councilor Zaro? Here. Councilor Trevorrow is absent. Councilor Pelletier? Here. Councilor Phillips? Here. Mayor Snyder? Here. And I did hear from Councilor uh, Trevorrow earlier that she may be delayed and she is planning to be here tonight. Uh, five o'clock public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. So we have a lot on tonight's agenda in terms of communications and proclamations, um, which means we don't take public comment on those items. So I just wanted to talk about that up front um, because that's uh, I know that that these these communications and proclamations are of interest. Some proclamations will be received by members of the community. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and so I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to that before we go to public comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. We do have a lot of content in those two areas of our agenda. But if you are here to address the council on something that does not appear on tonight's agenda, go ahead and approach the podium here in chambers or raise your hand on Zoom. Please step forward. And so if you wouldn't mind giving us your name and either the organization that you represent um, or your address or the neighborhood you live in, we're, we'll be happy to hear from you. And the clerk will keep the time. Uh, it's a three minute timer and she'll tell you when you've got 30 seconds left. I feel like I'm on an appellate court, which is what I used to do for 50 years. My name is Harley Lewin. We had a red, a green and a yellow. Um, I live in the West End. I live in Ting Street across the street from Harborview Park. I want to address you briefly on the issue of Tense. We do have two communications on our agenda tonight having to do with. I saw tense. them. Um, the only thing I wanted to make you aware of, if possible, and make a suggestion is that I was physically assaulted yesterday by some of the 10 people that are now harboring in Harborview Park. During the rain, um, they came out of the tents. They were threatening. They threw things. They're defecating. There are needles in that area. We have gone from one tent to 10 tents in the space of two weeks. Um, in calling the police, the police said you should only dial 911. Otherwise, they get internally reprimanded for taking any protective actions. My simple suggestion is not to displace people, to, but you cannot address the situation by simply saying that tents are a humane solution. When you have people defecating in front of small children, when you have needles being traded and used, it's impossible to say that this is humane, any more than humane than taking them somewhere to sleep. I spoke to one of them. He hasn't slept on something in, in four months on a mattress. But my suggestion on an interim basis is at the very least limit the number of tents to a given location. There's certainly enough green around. I got ganged up on yesterday by three different people from different tents in that immediate area and was basically forced, and the fallout is dreadful. I can't walk my dog in the park anymore. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge the important topic that you're talking about, and I do want to let folks know that within uh, Communication 36 tonight, we are planning a, an information sharing and listening session next week, which is a great opportunity to have folks come forward and talk with the council. So I just wanted to put that out there as we head into this public comment period, that there are items in the agenda that we'll get to these issues and the city's response. So hopefully we can uh, hear from folks who have items that are not on tonight's agenda, and then we'll get into the agenda and we'll go more deeply into those issues. Thank you. I wasn't aware of how deeply you were going in. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, I just wanted to at least, in, in case folks haven't had a chance to look at the agenda, there is there is a lot of information in there. We'll head over to Zoom right now where I've got a hand up from George Rowe. Uh, George Rowe, uh, West Bayside, 
Uh, I just wanted to wish everyone a national. Uh, uh, George, we can't hear you. Okay. Um, you hear me now, Peter? Do you can you tell what's happening? Okay. There's something funny with the screen down here. Okay. George, do you want to try again? Hmm. Well, I guess we'll pause there for a second. Okay, let's try this again. I think that um, it looks like George dropped from the meeting. Maybe he was having some technical issues. I don't know if it's us or if it's him. Is there any other public comment either here in chambers or come on and step forward, please? Um, you can just feel free to step forward. Anybody can get in line and also folks on Zoom if you wanna go ahead and raise your hand, but we have somebody at the podium. Thanks for being here. Namina Conte and I'm originally from Sierra Leone, West Africa, but I lived in New York City for almost 30 years and during the pandemic, I'm in my 60s and I have a long problem. So my daughter was here going to school in College of Art. And she says, Mama, Mama, you have to come here because I don't want to see you, you know, die there alone. So you guys know how people were dying in New York. So I ran and I came just to make her focus on her studies. But to cut matters short, I've been here since then. So I went to the Whole Foods Market and I saw this, little, this young man. He's trying to buy... Um, a drink that his parents sent him to buy. So he was being profiled by the police. So everybody, you can see it, everybody can see it and he was shaking. So I went and I said to him, what's going on? And he says, the police is watching me. And I say, I will stand by you, buy your drink and I will go, if you don't have money to pay, I'll pay just, just so I stood by him. He finished what he was doing and he left. And I didn't say anything, I came, so two weeks ago, I went to the Whole Foods store and I got, I've been profiled. I can see the police following me. So I went to one of those, the workers and I said, do you know they profile um, black people in the Whole Foods store? And the gentleman said, oh yeah. Say they've been doing this since Whole Foods been here. I say, even me, when I go to eat, they, when I take off my car, they watch me like as if I stole the food. So I asked for the manager, it's a white lady. And I said, do you know they profiled um, people like us in the Whole Foods store? And she said, she's not aware of it. And I said, yeah, you're not aware of it. I said, because they're not going to profile, they profile, they, they profile in all. I left. The next day, the police knows where I go in. I don't have a car. So I live down by the Whole Foods store on Anderson. Everything I do, I walked around. The police is there. I know you can say, they will say they are doing their job, but when somebody is following, they're aggressive. Last week, Saturday, I wake up every morning, six o'clock to do my work. So I do the cove. I'm coming and right in front of me like that. I'm not afraid, but I just don't know why they're doing it. As if they know where I live. When I come out, if I go to the fish market, if I go to the post office, if I go to my bank, they're already there. They will follow me aggressively. So I don't know what to do. I was in a clothing store and I was talking and a, a lady, she gave me her full name. She used to work here and he says, he say, I don't like what I'm hearing. I work in the city hall. He said, go there, they will listen. 30 second warning. And I, that's why I'm here. I don't know what to do, who to go to. And I'm just here by myself. So that's why I'm here. I don't know. It's pretty scary. I'm not afraid, but it's, it's really scary. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your public comment. If you can stick around, we'll make sure to check in with you. Uh, any other public comment? Uh, I, so we've got George, you're back with us on Zoom. Let's try this again and hope that it was your connection. Can you hear me now? Any luck? Nothing? So where are you hearing it? Because I can't hear it at all. You You can hear me or you cannot hear me? That's what I'm just going to ask Jessica. 
Uh, George, I apologize. We can't hear you. So I'm going to turn off my mic and we're going to take a five minute uh, pause here to try to figure out if the technology can be addressed here in the council chambers. See Brad. He's up now. Okay. Which makes a hybrid meeting tough to execute if you can't hear the people on Zoom. <laughs> If you weren't paying attention, I'd think it would bother. This is where everybody everybody becomes an IT specialist. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, that's a remote on that. Okay, we're if Councillor Fournier had a terrific idea. I'm going to turn the volume up on my laptop in hopes that we can hear the public comment, and I'll amplify it with the mic. Okay, so George, um, if you don't mind being uh, kind of a, a tester with us, uh, we'll start your public comment and I'm gonna unmute my microphone and you're gonna speak and we're gonna see how this goes. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay. So, is there an echo or any feedback? I just, I can't see it, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I, in the interest of making this work for, for anyone else who wants to watch this tonight. Relax, 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 relax. I'm happy to be a guinea pig, but is is this working enough to be worth trying? Yes. Oh, yes, it is. I'm, but I mess it up every time I talk, so just go ahead, and I think we can hear you. I'll interrupt if we can't. Okay, well, uh, I just wanted to wish everyone a National Caribbean Heritage Month. Uh, you're celebrating a number of things uh, later in the meeting, but that hasn't been recognized, and I just wanted to, to maybe uh, note that maybe you could uh, formally recognize that uh, at your next meeting before the end of the month. Um, I am speaking about uh, this evening about the um, the Bayside Master Development Plan that the Port Properties has been uh, unveiling the last few months at the planning board. Um, I'm very concerned because it's effectively a joint development project uh, with the city of Portland. The city of Portland planning staff have been very, very involved. The public works uh, staff have been very, very involved in assisting port properties in, in framing this and uh, working out a lot of the infrastructure needs and details. And I'm very concerned because this enormous project, the, the headline number is at 800 units of housing over a, a period of 10 years is uh, baked into this plan. And there's been very little community engagement. In fact, um, you know, people often talk, including the Bayside Neighborhood Association, that Bayside and West Bayside in particular is comprised of, of most of the people who live there, a heavy percentage of them are people of color and people of very uh, modest means or lower income uh, socioeconomic levels. And, all of those uh, stakeholders have been completely excluded from this planning process. They haven't been reached out to in any meaningful way. They haven't been brought into the process by uh, city staff. Our district one city councilor, Ann Arrow, to my knowledge, hasn't been involved in all, at all as a leader, as a facilitator, as a convener, and on top of that, the board, the chair of the planning board, uh, during his most recent uh, 
effort to be on the city council took thousands of dollars from employees and principals of poor properties. And that, and that, and that has not bothered to recuse them, even though they are clearly very involved in facilitating the, the interests of poor properties. So, so this is, this a, is a, a great example of, of a really broken planning process and neighborhood that is taking on the burden of housing Portland while every other neighborhood virtually says no to housing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Um, so, so as much as I love to talk about patience and sense of humor, I don't think that's really a great way to run a meeting. So I'm gonna look uh, upward and see whether or not there's any progress that may, it sounds like you're making some progress up there with uh, ish. Okay, <laughs> I'm getting this. All right, let's 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 give it another try because I don't see any more hands up on Zoom and I don't see anybody else stepping forward in chambers except for now. If you do wanna speak in chambers, just line up behind the podium. Um, no no need to, to, to wait, Go, come on forward and uh, we'll be happy to hear from you. Good afternoon or good evening. I'm Robert Haynes, Holm Avenue here in Portland. Three items first. Congratulations to the manager on your preferment as permanent city manager. Uh, basically, she's the only one in the room that I know on this side of the rail, because it's been eight years, I think, since I last attended a meeting. I do know Councillor Phillips because of her family and a former neighbor. Um, second thing I want to talk about is the family immigrant housing and the fact that Blueberry Road seems to have fallen through. I made two calls last week and did not get a one of either of them returned. I have a piece of land that's ideal. It doesn't have a building on it. And I don't know how quick the prefab could be made and placed on the property. It's, it's a little over an acre. It's uh, less than a quarter of a mile to a chain grocery store and probably a quarter mile, maybe plus a, a little bit more to Thompson's Point, which are work opportunities. Uh, what I really want to talk about is petitions. Uh, petitions are not supposed to be easy to do, but have to be doable. The number that you have before you now was done and the Phoenix or the uh, Ballard got it right, was when you had to come into the clerk's office to sign the petition. That made it very difficult to do. People might have supported what you wanted to do, but they'd be darned if they were going to come into City Hall to sign the petition. Ten years ago, I advocated that the number needed to be changed. I suggested 20 or perhaps 30 percent of the last voting in Portland during the gubernatorial election. Fell on deaf ears at that time. The uh, Number now, and I'll give credit to the, I call them the communists, but they're the People's Democratic whatever of Portland for coming up with the knowledge that with the group they have, it's easy to get the 15, uh, 1,500, 55, or whatever that magic number is now, and then put it on the spring ballot when not many people vote and they can get all their people out. 30 second warning. Okay, it needs to be changed. 10% seems very low to me, but uh, it's a lot better than what you've got now. Uh, those are my thoughts on it. Again, it, that, it's not supposed to be easy because it is the way it is now. They're usurping what you ought to be doing, and uh, but it has to be doable. And if you get enough people out on a gubernatorial election, a percentage higher than 10% ought to be doable in this city. Thank you very much. And it gives you some things to talk about and think about. Good to see you. Thank you for your comment. And welcome, Councillor Trevorrow. I don't think we have any more public comment. I don't see any more hands up on Zoom. Nobody's stepping forward in chamber. So I'm going to close public comment. And I'm going to let Councillor Trevorrow know we are having technical difficulties. So we're heading into the next portion of our agenda with 
fingers crossed that um, this hybrid works out. Okay, so uh, the next item on our agenda is announcements. Does anybody have any announcements this evening? From my colleagues on the council, I don't see any. So we're gonna move past announcements to recognitions. Will the clerk please read our first recognition? Recognizing Deering Center Neighborhood Association, board member Bobby Cope and the veterans of foreign wars post 6859 for their leadership in honoring and mourning the U.S. military per, uh, personnel who died while serving the United States Armed Forces and organizing this observation of Memorial Day 2023, sponsored by Mike D Mark Dion, Councillor. Councillor Dion. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Bobby Cole, would you stand, please? Now we're going to lead back off. You can come forward, Bobby, with your team. I just want to say a couple of words here. Thank Last, you. Thank you, Bobby. Last weekend was Memorial Day, and um, I had the pleasure and honor to participate in a ceremony that was held at Evergreen Cemetery to honor those who had died in the service of the United States. Now, I wanna begin by saying cities work not because City Hall gets it done. Cities work when neighborhoods get it done. And Bobby and her team got it done on Memorial Day. There are over 250 attendees uh, that participated in the function. Uh, the parade was something to be proud of. Uh, it included different representation, both military and non-military. The most touching uh, was a group of a dozen little girls and a few boys dressed in white carrying bouquets that were gonna be laid at the grave sites of certain veterans. It was a wonderful ceremony, Bobby. <clears throat> you had great speakers. You had music that fit the occasion. I saw lots of tears being brushed from cheeks as we went through the entire program. And none of that occurred other than for her force of will and her team to include the veterans of foreign wars. There was some city staff that also assisted in terms of traffic control and providing space and support at Evergreen Cemetery. This is like my fourth function that I've attended. And it took me four years to get a place on the dais just to say something. So it's a very select crew of individuals that granted the honor to speak on the question and responsibility we have to our war dead. So I wanna thank you on behalf of those who passed in service to our country for taking on that kind of work. Now, why the recognition? Well, I think it's important when neighborhood leaders step up and meet a civic responsibility. We need more of that, not less of it. But I was infuriated that night. I had a great time. I go home, I watch a certain media outlet, and they report that the whole thing was put on by the city of Portland. Would nary a mention of Bobby's work and her team. And that was infuriating to me, right? I don't mind if we get credit for something we had an active role in making happen, but we were less than a supporting actor in this one, okay? The credit goes to Bobby and the others who gave up their day so that we could recognize a tradition that should carry on. And that's why I brought this recognition forward to the council, because I think it's important for us to acknowledge that and recognize the people who actually met their civic responsibility in their tradition of honoring our war dead. Thank you very much, Bobby. Thank you, Council, for this moment. Thank you, Councilor Dion. Councilor Ali. Thank you, Mayor. Even though my colleague forgot to uh, mention that I also was there and I march. So, uh, Bobby, Thank you. And I have attended about five or six. I only missed last year. When do I get to speak? Thank you. Well, thank you very much again, um, uh, both counselors and um, Ms. Cope. Thank you so much for being here and bringing folks forward. We appreciate your attendance. Do you have something that you'd like to share? 
to. Okay. I gratefully accept this recognition on behalf of the Deering Center community and the Deering Memorial VFW post represented here this evening by Sergeant First Class United States Army retired Stephen Vale. Thank you, Councilors Dion and Ali, for your gracious acceptance of my invitation to participate in this important event. With your help, we presented a solemn program of remembrance for all armed service members killed while on active duty, with special focus on seven young men whose bodies were brought back from afar and laid to rest at home in Evergreen Cemetery. Several of their families were in attendance, which gave us the opportunity to make it personal for them and to acknowledge the momentous losses. There were many who proudly fulfilled their civic duty to remember, among them, the Deering Center Girl Scout Troop and other community children who, led by my granddaughter, Daisy Cope, Daisy Cope, who is here today, they laid flowers on the graves of two young veterans carrying on the 155 year old tradition of Decoration Day. We will continue this tradition each year and never forget those who gave their very lives in service to America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your leadership. Um, and for, as Councilor Dion said, for the leadership from your neighborhood organization to bring this asset to the city of Portland and to remember. So thanks again for being here tonight. And we do have another recognition this evening. Will the clerk please read that into the record? Recognizing Public Works employees Stan Mason and Justin Kusak for their first place finish in the 2023 State Snowplow Rodeo Competition uh, by Kate Snyder Mayor. Um, and I have the opportunity to share a little bit about this uh, this evening. The Maine State Snowplow Rodeo is a timed obstacle course for trucks and drivers held annually at the Skowhegan Fairgrounds and hosted by the American Public Works Association. Public, Public Works um, employees from Portland, Stan Mason and Justin Cusack bested 19 other municipal teams from across the state to win first place as the top team. They will represent the state of Maine at the national, the annual national snowplow rodeo competition in Colorado in September. So congratulations, thank you, and good luck. And uh, we'll move on to the next section of our agenda, which is the approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from our May 15th council Move meeting? passage. Second. Councillor Zara with a second from Councillor Ali, and we'll go ahead to vote to approve those draft minutes. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion just stepped out. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, those pass unanimously, and we move into proclamations. We've got three before us tonight. I'm actually not reading any of them, but my colleagues on the council will be. So will the clerk please read Proclamation 28, and I'll look to Councilor Zaro to read that into the record, please. Proclamation 28, 22, 23, recognizing June 2023 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month, sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing me the honor to read this year's proclamation, recognizing June 2023 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. I believe this is the third time I'm doing this. <laughs> Whereas the city of Portland, Maine is committed to being a safe, welcoming, and equitable community for all people across race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, sexual orientation, gender identification, country of origin, or any other identity, and whereas many of the residents, students, city employees, and business owners who contribute to the enrichment of our city are a part of the LGBTQ plus community, which includes people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer or questioning, two-spirit, and more. And whereas Portland, Maine has a strong LGBTQ plus community because it has truly been a safe haven for the queer community over the years. And whereas the Stonewall riots began in New York on June 28, 1969, and are regarded as the catalyst for the LGBTQ plus movement, 
of, uh, for civil rights in the United States. And whereas BIPOC trans activists, Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson and Miss Major Griffin Gracie are credited as the foremothers of the clashes with the authorities at Stonewall that night, launching queer liberation as we know it. And whereas June 26, 2023, marks the eighth anniversary of the US Supreme Court's decision in Obergfell v. Hodges that the 14th Amendment requires all states to grant same-sex marriages and recognize same-sex marriages granted in other states. And whereas June 28, 2023 marks the 50, uh, 53rd anniversary of the first gay pride marches in the history of the United States, and June is now celebrated as LGBTQ plus Pride Month nationwide. And whereas June 28, 2023 marks the 54th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, on which occasion the LGBTQ plus community recognizes more than half a century of the LGBTQ plus movement, celebrates and honors its accomplishments, and raises awareness of its ongoing struggles. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Kate Snyder, mayor of the city of Portland and uh, members of the Portland City Council do hereby recognize June as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in the city of Portland, Maine. And we invite citizens of Portland to honor the history of the fight for equality, to celebrate how far we've come and to recognize the work that we have left in front of us. And I'm going to take a moment, we have, um, Gia Drew with us from Equality Maine, and I'm gonna take a moment to, to share this and honor um, the work of Equality Maine, um, and we will get you a much nicer copy of this. Thank you, Councillor Zaro, and will the clerk please read Proclamation 29. Proclamation 29, 22, 23, recognizing June 19th, 2023 as Juneteenth, sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. And I will look to my colleague, Councillor Pelletier, to read this. Thank you. Whereas the Emancipation Proclamation signed on January 1, 1863, declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. And whereas more than two years later, on June 19, 1865, the last group of enslaved Americans located in the city of Galveston, Texas, learned that the Civil War had ended and that they were free from bondage. And whereas Black Americans commemorate Juneteenth as the day they were first recognized as citizens of this country. It is a day of a enormous significance, weight and power in which we remember the moral stain of chattel slavery on this country, as well as its long legacy of systemic racism, inequality and inhumanity. And whereas Juneteenth is a day in which we also recognize the many significant achievements and successes of Black Americans throughout our nation's history and in the present as we continue to walk the stony road towards racial equity. And whereas the historic work of striving for racial equity has been led by abolitionists and educators, civil rights advocates, lawyers, courageous activists, trade unionists, public officials, and everyday Americans, including those dedicated to realizing the ideals of our nation. And whereas the legacy of Black American resistance to systemic inequality, including suppression of the Black vote, redlining, and police violence is a testament to the struggle, courage, and hope of the Black community, while reminding us that the fight is not yet over. And whereas Juneteenth reminds us that while we are moving towards equity, equality, and justice, we still have more to do to advance true equity in all aspects of civic life, and that we must always strive for a better future. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Kate Snyder, Mayor of the City of Portland, Maine, and members of the City Council do hereby recognize June 19th, 2023 as Juneteenth in the City of Portland, and invite residents of Portland to join in celebrating how far we have come since the abolition of slavery, while putting our shoulders to the task of fighting for equity, equality, and justice this day and every day. Signed and sealed this fifth day of June, 2023. Thank you, Councillor Pelletier. Next, we'll go to, uh, I'll ask the clerk to please read Proclamation 30. Proclamation 30, 22, 23, recognizing the month of June 23, 23 as Immigrant Heritage Month, sponsored by Pius Ali, Chair. Oh, sorry, Councillor. 
Councillor Ali, we'll look to you for this one. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I am going to see. Proclamation recognizing the month of June 2023 as Immigrant Heritage Month. Whereas generations of immigrants from every corner of the globe have helped build our country's economy and created the unique character of our nation. And whereas immigrants continue to grow businesses, innovate, strength our economy, and create American jobs in Portland, Maine. And whereas immigrants have provided the United States with unique social and cultural influence, fundamentally enriching the extraordinary character of our nation. And whereas immigrants have been tireless leaders, not only in securing their own rights and access to equal opportunity, but also in campaigning to create a fair and more just society for all Americans. And whereas, despite the countless contributions, the role of immigrants in building and enriching our nation has frequently been overlooked and undervalued throughout our history and continue to the present day. And now therefore, be it resolved that Kate Snyder, mayor of the city of Portland and members of the Portland City Council do hereby proclaim June 2023 as Immigrant Heritage Month in the city of Portland. Set and so today, June 5th, 2023. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Next, we move into the appointments section of our agenda. Will the clerk please read order 225? Order 225. 2223, appointing William Needleman as Class E Director of the Portland Fish Exchange, sponsored by Danielle West, City Manager. I see Bill is here this evening. Um, Bill, we're just putting Bill as the, he's the waterfront coordinator in the Housing and Economic Development Department. Um, putting him on to a, another board, uh, the Portland Fish Exchange, as our Class C representative. Um, and he's held this position since June of 2022 when he was appointed to fill a midterm vacancy. So we're just asking uh, that, that he be reappointed. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for being here, Bill. And we'll see if there's any public comment on this Order 225 appointment. We do have a hand up on Zoom. We're going to hope for the best. George, go ahead. Uh, George Rowe, West Bayside. Any luck? We still can't hear you, George. Um, so I don't think we can proceed with a hybrid meeting unless we can hear folks on Zoom. We have any update from Jessica? Does it make sense? Am I still on? Peter, no answers up there? Has anyone tried just reaching out to someone else to test it other than me? George, if you can hear me, we cannot hear you. So we're going to give, yeah, um, let's let's give it a try. Everybody mute your, your uh, microphone. Go ahead, Peter. And George, go ahead. Okay, George Rowe, West Bayside. Is that coming through in any way? Go, uh, we can try it like this. Are you asking me to continue? Do you like me to speak? Go ahead, George. Okay, George Rowe, West Bayside. Is there any sound coming through to anybody? I think it's just coming from my laptop. Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Okay, George Rowe, West Bayside. Uh, I think this might be take three or four. Uh, um, sorry, sorry about that, George. Is uh, So this is being recorded? Like people in the room can hear this? 
Is that yes. okay? Um, I just again, I just want to make sure I'm not speaking into a void, um, even though you guys are making your best effort to to uh, make sure I come through. So, I just had a question. I know uh, Bill has been, you know, part of the waterfront okay. team for <laughs> for a very long time, um, oh, but I I wanted to know whether George, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you. It uh, it looks like the audio here in Chambers is going in and out because we can hear you through my laptop, but whether or not it's telegraphing over to the TV is is not consistent. Does that make sense to people? It's right at the, the is, that's right where it is. I don't, it's that, it's the, it's not this, it's that. Right. Well, we would have to do that for every public commenter on Zoom then. But I think the issue is my mic's working and my computer's working. It's only sometimes making its way to the TV. Peter, does that make sense? I don't, we, we've had so much time. I don't, um, um, Peter, I'm just going to ask you a quick question. Is this something that you think you could fix with some time if we were to take a break? Have you been working on it since the beginning? Okay. I just, I don't want to ask for a break if it's not going to be helpful. I think that's the trick is that my, it might be easy for somebody other than me to do it, but mine is working sometimes and not other times. So why would somebody else's mic and computer be different? Maybe it would. I'm just asking why. Okay. I don't know what I can do to fix it right now. Other than try to do what we did for the last Okay. I think why don't we do this? Why don't we take a 10, 10 minute break and can't, can't figure, figure it out? There goes our hybrid meeting. Okay. Um, so thanks everybody for your patience. Can you hear me, Peter? I've unmuted myself on Zoom. Peter? Uh, I, I have unmuted myself on Zoom. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. But Peter, I have somebody on Zoom who could act as a guinea pig if we want to try that. It to, I, I have somebody on Zoom who could, who's willing to raise her hand. It's a staff member and she could help us see if it's just George's mic. Actually, That's no. Me. I'm in, I can do it. It's Michael. You want me to do it? Yeah. Right, I was thinking we could ask Antora Grossa to raise her hand as somebody who's remote and then see if she can be heard. So I'm gonna allow. Okay, and and you're good to talk. Um, can you say hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Well, we can hear you because you have okay. your computer on. No, but that's Ann coming through the Zoom. So yeah, right. Oh yeah, but you, the Zoom, you, but not you mute, 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 mute your computer. Okay. 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 So we're not getting. 
her either on the uh, the speaker. Okay, thank you, Anne. What is okay? So it's not. I mean, it's not. George, it's not anybody's microphone from home. It's our audio here in chambers. Buddy here. Bill, we're this close to your appointment. Might not have it. Back tomorrow? No. It's going to be some meeting on the 26th, everybody. Kidding. <laughs> Just like a <I'm> normal. <laughs> Sorry, see my eyes. I got my head. <laughs> but not to the audio in chambers. If it doesn't work, we're going to have to cancel the meeting. And canceling the Zoom portion of the meeting, it's canceling the meeting because if we advertise a hybrid meeting, state law tells us that we have to have a hybrid meeting. So our fingers are crossed. Unless, again, unless there's some technology breakthrough in the meantime with the smart board, uh, we're gonna try this one more time. And if it doesn't work, we're gonna have to cancel the meeting. So we are mid appointment. We are in public comment. <laughs> That's gonna be fun. Um, George, I hate to ask you to come back as a public commenter. Um, I'll look for your hand in case you wanna try this with, with us again. Otherwise, we if we don't have other hands up on Zoom, we can just take public comment in chambers and move through this appointment and move on to our next item. So we can kind of do what we've done up until this point in the meeting, which is if we don't have public comment on Zoom, we can still do our meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm winging this here, so any uh, any, constructive feedback is welcome. So I'm going to close public comment on order 225 and I'm going to ask for a motion from the council. Second. Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Zaro. Is there any comment? I see none. Go ahead and vote. Uh, Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> that was <laughs> some appointment. Okay, we really appreciate you being here, Bill, and we will move on with our agenda. Uh, will the clerk please read order? Hold on a second here. Okay, we've got a little bit of, we've got some notes on, will you please read, read order 226? Order 226, 22, 23, appointing constables for the parks, recreation, and facilities, and police departments and Jetport, Jetport Garage employees for 2023, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. And I'll look to the city manager for comment here. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is just a uh, annual appointment that we do um, for uh, parks, rec, and facilities, and police departments. They are just uh, individuals who carry out enforcement of our various ordinances. There is an amendment in the backup materials to add um, several park rangers to this order. So we would ask that uh, some member of the council please move that so that we can get everyone um, that we need appointed as a constable appointed. Thank you, and I'd be happy to read that amendment into the record so that it can be included in the public comment period. So we've been asked to consider an amendment to Order 226 um, that replaces the name Maria Goodstein with Aiden Foss. Um, so again, the order is in your backup. Um, all we're doing in the second stanza is uh, replacing one name with another. So uh, amendment to replace Maria Goodstein with Aiden Foss. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go back to Zoom and I'm gonna see if there's any public comment on this order or any public comment in chambers. Seeing none, close public comment. Come back to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second. Councilor Zaro with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. I'd like to take the opportunity to offer an amendment to order 226 to replace uh, Maria Goodstein with Aiden Foss. Is there a second? Second. Amendment from me, seconded from Councillor Ali. I'm gonna ask for any comment or questions on the amendment. 
We'll go ahead and vote on the amendment, please. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dylan? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. So order 226 has been amended. Is there any council discussion on the amended order before you? We will go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 226 passes unanimously. And last under this section, I'll ask the clerk to please read orders 227. Order 227, 22, 23, confirming Governor Mills' appointment of John Henshaw to the Board of Harbor Commissioners, sponsored by Daniel West, City Manager. Thank you. Um, this is just, uh, John Henshaw is the Executive Director of the Maine Port Authority um, and Director of the Ports and Marine Transportation. He's been appointed by Governor Mills as per the um, statute. Uh, to serve on the um, Harbor Commission. And so we have put this forward as a confirmation um, as per the commission's rules uh, before the council. Thank you. Is there any public comment on order 227? Seeing none, I'll pl close public comment. Come back to the council for a motion, please. So moved, second. Councilor Rodriguez, second from Councilor Zaro. Council discussion on this item. Seeing none, we can vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 227 passes unanimously. We'll move into the consent calendar on our agenda this evening. Will the clerk please read both? Orders 228 and 229. Order 228, 22, 23, declaring July 4th, 2023 as the July 4th festival, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. And order 29, or 229, 22, 23, declaring Sundays from June 16th through September 23rd, 2023, the Open Air Sundays Festival on Lower Exchange Street, sponsored by the Sustainability and Transportation Committee, Councilor Andrew Zaro, Chair. Thank you. And I'll look to the manager for comment on these two items. Um, I will defer to uh, Councillor Zaro on any comment he may have on the Open Air Sundays Festival. But um, with regard to the July 4th uh, festival, uh, you'll see it's just um, um, basically authorizing fireworks. Um, the food trucks will be in the same location as they are right now. Um, and there will not be this year, um, as in past years, any uh, music or anything uh, as part of this event, but the fireworks will occur. Thank you, Councillor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, everything's in the packet, but just to reiterate, this went through sustainability and transportation recently, Open Air Sundays. It's a project that's being led by our uh, friends over at Portland Downtown. It uh, is on Sundays only um, uh, for, I believe, 10 Sundays if we approve it this evening. Uh, it's lower Exchange Street from uh, middle to four. Uh, overall, um, we were told in committee that um, all of the businesses were in support of this with the exception of one business, but they are closed on Sunday, so it does not impact them. Uh, there's gonna be an economic impact study to uh, better understand uh, after this program's over, how it helped, how it may have hindered, et cetera. Um, and Portland downtown is uh, really excited to do a lot of programming in the streetscape, you know, right? cities, cities are for people. Uh, so that's the, the intention of the open air Sundays to, to kind of energize and place make the lower part of exchange. Um, so we unanimously supported it in our committee uh, and it is before us this evening for a vote. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you for bringing that work through committee. Uh, is there any public comment on either of these two items? Is it, um, it's terrible to think. Please don't raise your hand on Zoom, but I am curious also. Uh, we don't have any hands up on Zoom for this one, so I'm going to close public comment and we're going to come back to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second, Councillor Zara with a second from Councillor Fournier. Council discussion on the consent items. Seeing none, we'll vote to approve. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chabarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Orders 228 and 229 passed unanimously. We head into licenses. We've got quite a few this evening. Will the clerk please read order 230? 
Order 230-22-23, granting municipal officers approval of end to tail. Application is for Parklet Outdoor Dining located at 29 Exchange Street, sponsored by Daniel West, City Manager. Thank you. Is there public comment on Order 230? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Come back to the uh, council for a motion. So moved. Second. Councilor Ali, the second from Councilor Zaro. Council discussion. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote to approve. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 230 passes unanimously, and if the owners of end to tail are here with us this evening, either in person or on Zoom, uh, thank you for being here, and also thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Next, we'll go to order 231, please. Order 231, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Green Elephant Vegetarian Bistro. Application is for a class three and four food service establishment located at 608 Congress Street, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Thank you. Is there public comment on order 231? I'm looking out here. Nope, nowhere, no hands up. Uh, close public comment, come back to the council for a motion. So moved, second. Councilor Ali with a second from Councilor Zaro. Council discussion. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote to approve. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. 231 passes unanimously if the owners of Green Elephant are with us in person or on Zoom. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you very much for doing business in the city of Portland. Your license is approved. Will the clerk please read order 232. 32, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of the Portland Beer Hub. Application is for class one food service establishment with outdoor dining on public public property located at 320 Fort Street, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Thank you. It says Fort here. Thank you, 324 Street. Um, is there any public comment on order 232? I see none, I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion. Move passage. Second. Councilor Zara with a second from Councilor Ali. Council discussion on this order. We can go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 232 passes unanimously. And if the owner of Beer Hub is high, how are you doing? Um, with us, which you are, thank you for being here and thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Uh, order 233, please. Order 233, 2223, granting municipal officers approval of the Henry. Application is for indoor entertainment located at 375 4th Street, sponsored by Daniel West, City Manager. Thank you. Is there public comment on Order 233? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Come back to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second. Councilor Zara with a second from Councilor Ali. Any council discussion? Councilor Phillips? Thanks. I just want to um, <clears throat> um, let some let uh, Mr. Miranda know that Tay Chung is no longer the city council representative in District Three. Um, I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phillips. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier. Yes. Councillor Rodriguez. Yes. Councillor Dion. Yes. Councillor Ali. Yay. Councillor Zaro. Yes. Councilor Trevorrow. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Councilor Phillips. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Order 233 passes unanimously. Thank you very much for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read order 234. Order 234, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Commercial Street Pub. Application is for indoor entertainment located at 129 Commercial Street, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Uh, and is there any public comment on order 234? none, I'll close public comment, come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second. Councilor Ali with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. Council discussion. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 234 passes unanimously and if the owners of Commercial Street Pub are with us tonight, 
uh, thank you. And um, also thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Order 235. Order 235-22-23, granting municipal officers approval of Riverton Station. Application is for outdoor dining on private property located at 1569 Forest Ave, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Thank you. Is there any public comment on order 235? I see none. I'm going to close public comment and come back to the council for a motion. Move passage. Second. Councillor Dion with a second from Councillor Zaro. Any council discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chavarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That passes unanimously. And if the owners of Riverton Station are here with us this evening, thank you. And thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Next, we'll go to order 236, please. Order 236, 2223, granting municipal officers approval of East Ender. Application is for a class 11 restaurant and lounge with outdoor dining on uh, public property and indoor entertainment located at 47 Middle Street, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Thank you. Public comment on order 236. Seeing none, I will close public comment, come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second. Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Rodriguez. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we can go ahead and vote. Councillor Forner? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chamaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. And if the owners of East Ender are here with us this evening, either in person or on Zoom, thank you. And thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. And lastly, on our list of licenses tonight, will the clerk please read order 237. Order 237, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Ton Ton 2. Application is for a class one food service establishment located at 782 Forest Ave, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Uh, is there any public comment on order 237? Seeing none, I'll close public comment, come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Councilor Ali. Second. Second from Councillor Rodriguez. Discussion? None. We'll go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yay. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 237 passes unanimously. And if the owners of Tonton 2 are here with us this evening, thank you. And thank you so much for doing business in the city of Portland. Okay. All licenses done and approved this evening. Um, we didn't get to test our Zoom public comment, but we made it through that portion of the agenda. So that's exciting. We'll move on to our budget items. Couple things on this front. Um, as was announced at last uh, the last council meeting, we will be postponing the budget items until our next council meeting, which is on a special date, June 26th. However, public comment was, um, advertised for tonight on the budget. So we'll take public comment because it was on the agenda and um, I wanna make sure that we're consistent with what's been out there in the public. Um, two things to note on that front. Um, we will be taking public comment when the council take a takes action on June 26th. So if you'd like to wait and hold your public comment until that time, that's fine. Again, we're just postponing the budget items tonight. If you do speak tonight, just like if you spoke at our last meeting, um, about the budget items, we would ask that you not speak on the 26th and give folks an opportunity who haven't yet had the chance to speak. So um, what I'm gonna do initially, because we've got so many budget items is ask if there's any public comment. If there is public comment, we'll hear that and then we'll head into the many budget items before us for actions to postpone. I see nobody stepping forward in chambers. I don't see any hands up on Zoom. Okay, I'm gonna close public comment. And like I said, we're going to um, head into these budget items. Please be aware that we will be taking action on them on June 26th. We welcome your comment at that time. And I also wanted folks to know that I'm gonna be asking us to um, postpone order 224 um, under unfinished business along with the packet of budget items. Um, it's the authoriz authorizing amendment to downtown Transit Oriented Development and Omnibus Tax Increment Financing District, which is essentially a budget item. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, oh, do we, do we need to read them all into the record? Well, I can read them all into the record. 
we can do one at a time because we have to vote on them one at a time. Right. Away. We have to vote on each and every one. We can't do them in a lump. So what's your preference? I would say read them all into the record and then we will quickly make our way through the order numbers and the roll call votes to postpone. All right. Okay, thank you. Order 209, 22, 23, approve fiscal year 2024 administrative fees for city parking garages and parks, recreation and facilities department. Order 210, 22, 23, authorizing the city manager to enter into certain agreements to implement the fiscal year 2024 human resources and certain fringe benefits budgets. Order 211, 22, 23, approving the fiscal year 2024 self-insured liability program. Order 212, 22, 23, authorizing the director of parks, recreation and facilities to set fees and enter into rental agreements for city facilities. Mm -hmm. Order 213-2223, authorizing the city manager to enter in certain agreements to implement fiscal year 2024 health and human services budget. Order 214-2223, authorizing the city manager to accept scholarship and trust donations and bequests and enter into trust agreements. Order 215-2223, authorizing the director of parks, recreation, and facilities to accept donations up to 10,000 for parks, recreations, and facilities department programs and city funds. Order 216, 22, 23, authorizing Corporation Council to undertake civil actions to collect the delinquent personal property taxes. Order 217, 22, 23, authorizing non-union wage adjustments. Order 20, uh, 218, 22, 23, designating fiscal year 2024 funds for specific island services. Order 219, 22, 23, appropriating 3,611,343 in fund balance. Um, at order 220, 22, 23, appropriating 276,000 from excess funds for Casco Bay Island Transit District. Order 221, 22, 23, amendment to the Portland City Code chapters 24 and 28 regarding various fee increases for fiscal year 2024. In order to, uh, 222, 22, 23, fiscal year 2023, 2024, appropriation resolve. Um, they're all sponsored by Daniel West. City manager, and did you want me to read that other one, which was again the money? Order 224. Thank you. Order 224, 2223, authorizing amendment to downtown transit oriented development and OMS tax increment financing district to increase funding for Creative Portland. Um, also sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Thank you so much. Take a break for a second, get a drink of water. I think what we'll do at this point is um, I'm happy to offer a motion to postpone and I'll be looking for a second as we make our way through the list. So motion to postpone order 209. Second. Councilor Ali with the second and we'll go ahead and vote. So much for press. Councilor Fournier. Yes. Councilor Rodriguez. Yes. Councilor Dion. Yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Zaro. Yes. Councilor Chavarro. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Councilor Phillips. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes, we have postponed order 209, motion to postpone 210. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second, and we'll vote to postpone. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Jaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. I offer a motion to postpone order 211 to June 26. Do I have a second? Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second. We'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That's postponed. Offer a motion to postpone order 212 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That is postponed. I offer a motion to postpone order 213 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That's postponed. I offer a motion to postpone order 214 to June 26th. Okay. Second. Councilor Rodriguez <laughs> with a second. Mayor, come on, don't. <clears throat> Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? 
Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. yes. That order is postponed. I offer a motion to postpone order 215 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second. Councilor Bornier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. I offer a motion to postpone order 216 to June 22nd. 27th, 26th, June 26th. <laughs> Councillor Ali with a second. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yeah. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chavarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That is postponed, and I offer a motion to postpone order 217 to June 26th. Second. Councillor Rodriguez with the second. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That is postponed. I order, I offer a motion to postpone order 218 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That order is postponed. I offer a motion to postpone order 219 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? <laughs> yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That motion is postponed. That order is postponed. Order two, I, motion, I offer a motion to postpone 220 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. And that is postponed. I offer a motion to postpone Order 221 to June 26th. Second. Rodri Councilor Rodriguez with the second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Hey. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That order is postponed. I offer a motion to postpone Order 222 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Hey. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That order is postponed and we'll leap over to um, where I will offer a motion to postpone order 224 to June 26th. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with the second. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 224 is also postponed to June 26. So we can thank Zoom for the, all those roll call votes, right? If not for Zoom, we could take them in a packet, but we cannot. So that was a successful postponement of all budget orders. Um, and we will move, continue to move through our agenda. Um, make sure I know where we are. Okay, up to communications. So we have three communications before us this evening. Will the clerk please read communication 34? Communication 34, 22, 23, communication regarding city council's ad hoc search committee sponsored by Kate Snyder, mayor. This one's for me. Um, this is really a very simple communication, as you can see from what is in the packet. I just wanted to clarify that the search committee was originally formed and named the city manager search committee, and that was some time ago. Um, the work was actually put on hold while the Charter Commission did their work, and um, the citizens voted on recommendations from the Charter Commission. During that time, the city manager search committee actually conducted the work to um, uh, bring forward a process for the full council's consideration regarding the city clerk's hiring last summer. Um, and we are now embarking on the work um, to hire corporation council after a successful city manager search that culminated in a vote in May to name Danielle West. So the point here is that this city manager search committee that was created some time ago has um, really expanded its scope of work. And so as not to confuse anybody, we just wanted to be on the record to say that the city manager search committee is really has become known as the search committee um, throughout the clerk search and now into the corp council search. So 
Um, this is really just a communication to let folks know that uh, the city councilors who serve on this committee, Councilor Fournier, Councilor Dion, Councilor Ali, and I will consider continue this work as a committee of the council. Um, and this is very important work when we are uh, conducting search processes. We do um, a lot of the process work on behalf of the council. And then of course, decision-making resides with the full body. So just wanted to be on record to let folks know that the search committee is um, the search committee. Any questions? It's a communication, no public comment. That's it. Will the clerk please read communication 35? Communication 35-22-23 regarding decommissioning of the Portland Expo as a temporary emergency shelter. Um, this one is by Kristen Dowd, our Director of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Kristen has been waiting patiently uh, for us. Um, and Kristen Dow, you can come up to the, to the mic. She's our Director of Health and Human Services. Um, this is just a communication from her to talk about the process of decommissioning the exposition building, which we've been using as a temporary emergency shelter for asylum seekers, um, and she'll walk us through it. Thank you for being here, Kristen. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? All right. Am I good? It's been a while since <laughs> I've been here. I'm back in, from Zoom. But so um, we opened the uh, expo as a temporary emergency shelter back in April. We knew that uh, it would be a temporary shelter and that it had other uses coming in September. Um, since then, we have served about 394 unique individuals in the expo. We did um, hit capacity, which is 300 within the first week of opening, like we thought that we would. Um, but I just wanted to highlight some really amazing work that's been done um, by our city staff here in social services and in public health at the expo. Before we talk about the decommissioning, um, our public health team has been the one this time. In 2019, we worked with the main CDC and public health nurses and the main CDC to do the health screenings. But um, this round, our public health division has been the one leading the screenings. We've done 336 medical screenings uh, and given 764 vaccines in total. Um, we have 352 registered volunteers that have been completely vetted through our system. Um, and we currently have 15 different service providers providing services on site for these individuals. So we did know that this was going to be temporary. And um, so we have a, an emergency operations center going, uh, which is why Chief Cattrall is here as well. Um, and he is, he is a part of the command staff for that. That is why, quite frankly, this has really one, run very smoothly. We were meeting daily for a while. We are now meeting twice a week. Um, and everything we had then decided we needed to have a meeting to discuss the decommissioning uh, of, of the expo and the closure of the expo. Um, it was determined that there is the next big event for the uh, expo is the contractually, we're contractually obligated to is on September 8th. Um, and so we decided to have the last day um, and the closure date be August 16th. And that will allow us uh, or allow city staff time to restore the building. It's not meant to be a 24 seven shelter um, for that amount of time. So there's, there is some definitely rest and restoration that's going to need to be done to the building uh, to get it up and ready for, for that, um, that first event. And the way we have in the past when we have decommissioned or closed temporary emergency shelters like in 2019 with the expo and then most recently the days in, in South Portland we use as an emergency shelter, we have to have a date where we can no longer take new people into the shelter to allow us time to depopulate the shelter so that people on August, what we do not want to have happen is on August 16th to have 300 people with no place to go. Um, and so we have picked that date, which happens to be today, actually the date of this communication. This We had our meeting a few weeks ago, but this is um, the date was today that gives us nine weeks to uh, depopulate the shelter and get people into different emergency shelters or housing uh, and, and different services. There's a total of 88 families uh, there. We're still at capacity at 300, um, but a total of 88 families. Uh, and those 88 families will be focusing on over the next nine weeks. Director Dow, thank you so much for being here with us and for this communication. Are there any questions or comments from counselors? 
I want to extend gratitude um, to you and your staff, uh, all the HHS staff, including public health, uh, opening up the expo um, as you did so rapidly. I know it happened so quickly. So you were able to act very, very quickly in order to meet the need, as you mentioned in your memo, of people leaving a school gymnasium and giving them an alternative place in the city of Portland to be um, as we make our th way through these challenging um, days where we just don't have enough emergency beds. So I want to thank you very much for that, um, the elasticity that you and your staff have shown. Okay. Step back for a minute. Okay. I think don't stick around though. Uh, will the clerk please read order uh, communication 36. Communication 36, 22, 23, regarding the city of Portland encampment crisis response team, also by Kristen Dowd, our director of health and human services. So director Dow's here to speak to this item as well. Um, this is just about the uh, encampment re crisis response team, which we kicked off last week. Um, Kristen will give an update on that. Um, there's also uh, a letter that we've included in the backup materials, which um, the mayor and I sent on Friday, which I believe the mayor will speak to uh, after after Kristen. So thank you for being here again. Um, okay, hello all. <laughs> uh, um, so the um, the encampment crisis response team. I first want to just address the name chain. Um, we we were calling it a task force. For a while, and I know that we, I spoke with um, many of you on Zoom about um, a task force, and you saw the recommendation from the Health and Human Services uh, Department on development of task force. But I think the term task force really, many of us have probably sat on one where you just sit around and you talk about work that needs to be done and develop something that goes and sits on a shelf, and that's not what this is. So this is really a crisis response team that is action oriented, action driven, and will be moving something forward. So. We, um, we we spoke about it and, and really decided on um, the encampment crisis response team being the name of, um, of this team. We are working really closely with the technical assistance providers that have been provided by HUD. They are not, they don't work directly for HUD, but um, wow. they are provided to us by them. Um, we, they took the recommendations that we put forward and are supporting that. Um, we have worked with them to take the structure that we have put forward once again, it's emergency operations center um, structure. It is going to be co-led by health and human services, uh, fire and police. Once again, my chief Petro is here um, and we will be leading that. We are developing seven different teams that will sit within um, the emergency um, and the encampment crisis response team. And those teams will focus on on things like the mobile engagement center, um, housing inventory, um, housing placements, data, uh, they're, they're all listed in the, um, in the memo. But we had our first meeting with providers. There were, um, I think, 18 different nonprofit service providers um, from both you know, local and, and some state uh, that were invited to a meeting last week on the 31st where we kicked it off. We asked that have one service provider, one, one person from each organization that can help make a decision and really commit that organization to supporting this. That was something that we talked a lot about with you all. Um, how do we get that level of commitment? And I'm happy to say that many, um, that many service providers have not only signed up to be a part of the different teams, but have also signed up to help lead. I don't want this to be while the city is taking the lead and ushering this forward, uh, this is an ownership of the entire community. It was really clear uh, in our first meeting that we, the city of Portland can't do this alone. This is taking all of the good work that is currently being done by all of the service providers and really channeling it into a targeted uh, and organized way uh, at each encampment as we as we look at them. Um, and we have now taken these teams, which everyone signed up for on the 31st, and we'll be having our first uh, team meetings with three of the three of the primary teams, which will be starting, um, which is basic needs, uh, a basic needs team, um, the mobile engagement center, and then the inventory, the housing inventory team will be meeting this Wednesday, uh, June 7th in the afternoon. Um, and we have decided that the very first encampment that we will be 
um, looking at and, and focusing on is the Four River uh, Parkway encampment. Thank you very much, Director Dow. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, next steps on that front or next steps? <laughs> next steps. Um, so I think that next steps will be to uh, meet again in groups and start to really uh, work, uh, focused work on the, the Four River um, encampment, as uh, Director Dow said. But um, also, I, I know uh, the council, I think, in, in speaking with you as well as uh, staff, we've heard a lot from the members of the public who really want to speak to this issue. And so in that vein, we've scheduled uh, for June 13th from 5.30 to 8 um, at Ocean Gateway, a listening session uh, where we will be uh, giving some information, uh, providing that to everybody, getting uh, sort of consistent messaging out there about exactly what's happening with the crisis response team, as well as just addressing the facts of the situation in general. And then really wanna hear from everybody in the public specifically about concerns or questions um, and, and listen to all of that, uh, like I said, from 5.30 to 8 on June 13th. Um, I will be present along with uh, most of the members of the council, um, and we really look forward to everybody being there. And um, I just also want to give a really big thank you uh, to staff for all the work that they're doing on the crisis uh, response team, but also to all the service providers. Um, I was present at the kickoff meeting last week, and um, it was a, a wonderful showing of a significant amount of support from many, many service providers, almost all of them within the city. Um, and so I'm really hopeful that we'll start to see some progress and be able to get people the help and services and housing that they need and really be able to address this moving forward. Uh, thank you to the city manager. So I'm, I'm gonna add a couple of comments here to this communication. Um, I wanna start out by saying thank you to Councilor Fournier and the HHS committee members. Um, your agendas have gotten bumped a couple of times in order to accommodate both special meetings and our response to uh, working through some of these issues. So thank you. And that's happening actually again next week on June 13th at the time of the listening session. Um, Councilor Fournier graciously said we could go ahead and use that meeting time. Um, our schedule is honestly so jam-packed, it's difficult to find evenings and we don't wanna postpone we already have to postpone so often, um, but we needed to find a time when we could notice it appropriately, invite people, plan for it, and, um, and, and make it the evening that it ought to be. So like the manager said, next Tuesday the 13th down at Ocean Gateway starting at 5.30, we welcome the community. Um, and again, my thanks to Councilor Fournier. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend the Encampment Crisis Response Team meeting last week. Um, to help welcome people, but mostly to be a listener. And as Director Dow said, at least 18 uh, community organizations were there with staff. Um, it was an incredible turnout. I learned a lot by, by being there, but I also wanna shout out to the fact that we had Director Dow, uh, Chief Gatro, Chief Gorham. We had uh, members of staff from uh, DPW, from Parks and Rec, from leadership I mean, the city of Portland is stepping forward with a tremendous amount of leadership and compassion and dedication. So I want to note that because um, sometimes we're told the city government isn't doing enough. But I will say that as I left that meeting on Thursday, I thought I am awfully proud to be a Portland resident because our city government is doing Herculean work to address very big challenges. So thank you. Um, so. As we all know, we've been struggling and the ex the uh, communication before this one about the expo um, is just illustrative of the fact that the city of Portland has been trying to meet needs and we haven't been able to. We budget for and we staff for two municipally run shelters. Um, the recently open and expanded um, sh homeless services center out on Riverside Street 208 beds, which is another 54 beds from the rented space that for so many years served as a homeless shelter on Oxford Street. And we also budget for and staff 146 beds at the Chestnut Street Family Shelter. Um, but so many times um, over the years, and certainly during this past year, the city has gotten very creative and elastic with resources and capacity and has done what we can to meet the increased need. 
Um, and we all talk about it every single day and it is a, a huge priority for the city. And as all of you know, the city manager and I go up to Augusta regularly um, during this legislative session. We'll be back up on Wednesday. We're trying to get up there weekly because there's so many important things happening. Um, we've had the opportunity to sit with the governor, which is a wonderful opportunity. Um, we have open lines of communication with her staff, with our legislative delegation and other folks up in Augusta. But um, we also realize that being on record and sharing information beyond talking is so important. And so last week we worked on this communication that we sent, as the manager said, to the governor on Friday afternoon. Uh, we did receive acknowledgement of the communication um, by email on Friday afternoon, but I wanted to just take a couple of minutes. I think it's that important to walk through um, the communication that we sent. Um, we talk about, um, sorry, just getting there on my computer. Um, it's an information sharing correspondence. It's also a, re a request making correspondence. So, um, sharing into the record this evening. Um, we know that since the fall of 2021, thousands of asylum seekers have arrived in the city of Portland seeking shelter and services. And since January of this year, the average weekly census in, of new arrivals um, is 80 per week. So we're on average getting 80 people coming to the city of Portland every week, both individuals and families. And the majority of people coming uh, from the, are from the Southern border. Um, we all know that Portland uniquely um, made a decision decades ago to operate a municipal shelter. And since that time, um, and in response to the state's general assistance law and the city's commitment to helping people in need, we've expanded and grown our commitment, both in terms of budget and shelter beds. Um, at the moment, we host 654 emergency shelter beds that are municipally operated shelters. So again, 208 at the Homeless Services Center, 146 at the family shelter, and at this moment, 300 at the expo. Um, we do start out by asking Governor Mills to acknowledge, and as we do, that we are doing everything that we can to respond to this ever-increasing need for shelter of two very distinct populations. We've got folks seeking asylum, and we've got folks who um, find themselves circumstantially unhoused. And so right now, the majority of the shelter beds in Portland are being um, occupied by asylum seekers. Um, and we know that a lot of folks um, who are in uh, uh, tents um, are, are not being housed. Um, and, and so we're, we're struggling and we're asking for help. Um, so we go on to say with the uh, emergency shelter beds full, hotels in the region either at capacity or no longer accepting unhoused individuals, either due to the changes in COVID protocol or changes to local ordinances. Um, and of course, the limited availability of affordable housing stock, we just can't meet the need. Um, we cannot meet the demand for emergency shelter beds, even though we have 654 hosted and staffed in the city of Portland at this time. And as a result, more and more circumstantially unhoused people um, more than we've ever seen before, um, have been sleeping outside in tents. Uh, at, at last count, or at least as of last Friday, we, we believe there are uh, at least 130 tents throughout the city. Um, and we get a lot of outreach from constituents. I don't think anybody's saying that this is a good um, and, and fair response to being unhoused. Um, it's, it's not ideal. So we let the governor know that we are continuing to work as collaboratively as possible, expand municipal resources, leverage um, both state uh, and federal aid um, and partnership. Um, and of course the community organizations that Kristen and her team have been able to pull in through this crisis response team. Um, we really need more help. Um, unfortunately, starting on May 8th, 2022, uh, over a year ago, we did let folks know that um, people applying for GA in Portland are given information to conduct a, a self-directed housing search. Um, and this isn't where we want to be. We want to be able to offer people the shelter and the services they need to, uh, to, to move through the challenge of not being housed. Um, so we let the governor know about the encampment crisis response team, um, uh, all the partners that are at the table, the fact that HUD has sent partners who are at the table. Um, 
the convening is modeled on the structure of an emergency operations center, um, which I know was employed during the 2019 use of the expo. And our staff is clearly expert at doing this work and pulling together um, a plan and a team to inform the plan that can then be executed. So thank you for the expertise that you bring to the table. It's very, very impressive. Um, uh, so we did ask the governor um, for continued support um, for the emergency shelter for asylum seekers that are in SACO. Um, and we requested additional state level capacity to coordinate services and shelter for asylum seekers and to develop additional emergency shelters and or transitional housing with supportive services throughout the state in order to meet the needs of all Mainers who find themselves unhoused. We continued to ask for her support of LD 1644 and its fiscal note this is the bill that would increase state reimbursement for general assistance from 70% to 90%. Um, so um, we have a wonderful um, state government. We have good partnership with the governor and we wanted to make sure that she knows where we are and the struggles that we face. Right now, the weather is warm, but what we know is that last December, January, February, there were freezing, freezing weekends and evenings and we didn't have the shelter that we needed. And we have a crisis situation with folks outside in tents at this point in time. And so we have, um, we have a lot to take care of in the moment. And as we look to colder weather, um, because it's our reality in the state of Maine and we have, to, um, we have to think ahead. So lastly, we did invite the governor to visit Portland. Um, we would love to be able to offer a tour of the new homeless services center and other sites as time allows. So wanted to let folks know that we've done that outreach and I welcome any questions or comments from the council. Councilor Fournier. Thank you so much. Oh, I forgot I had my microphone on. Um, so one of the questions I had not about the letter, I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, it's about the listening session. Um, I want to be super mindful that often when we have listening sessions, those who are able to access the meeting are the ones that are heard and where we are talking about a population that may not have access to a phone or Zoom or even transportation to get to Ocean Gateway. I don't know if it's working with our partners who are currently on the ground working with these individuals. Um, or if there's any way for us to be able to help provide transportation to make this space accessible. Um, I do think it's really important that we hear from everybody that's affected, especially those who are living, whether it's in tents or in our shelter system. Um, if it's a true community listening session, I wanna make sure we're including all community members. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fournier. Other comments, questions on that communication? Councilor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think the two, well, first I wanna say thank you uh, to Councilor Fournier uh, for your flexibility with HHS. Um, and thank you both um, for this letter. Uh, I'm gonna sit down, it's gonna be easier. You know, one thing that's really sticking out to me and, and anyone who's watching the meeting in person or remotely is if you look in the bottom of the first page of the letter that you've sent, I appreciate you breaking down the numbers because we talk about them a lot. You've, you've been here, Director Dow, a couple of times and they change so rapidly. Uh, and I think people uh, expect that Portland, we, we tend to meet the moment and that's because you work really hard and staff does a really good job. But I appreciate you outlining what the severity of, of these numbers are and that we are respectfully asking for some, some assistance from our partners, because it is a partnership. Uh, but I, I, I think even just breaking down the percentages and then we look at all of our unhoused neighbors, who are desperately seeking services that we have the infrastructure for, 654 emergency beds. And so I, I think the reason I'm bringing this up is because I do want the community to know that city staff and the council and the manager and the mayor are trying really hard. And even though we are doing everything we can and using almost every tool in our toolbox, at, at, at the moment, there, there is still more. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay optimistic that we are gonna work in partnership with the state uh, and with the community. Uh, but I just wanted to reflect on that for a moment because this is, this is a marathon. This is, gonna, this is gonna take a while, especially with the previous communication looking at that we are limited in space with the expo having to be decommissioned. 
Uh, I do, uh, to the director, Director Dow, uh, you pointed out that there are uh, 18 nonprofit providers representing six different sectors, which is wonderful. I'm wondering, or it might be too early, at this point, do you know if there are any policy recommendations the committee and the council will be expecting from, from these folks with you know, expertise in, in the field? think that that's a possibility um, as we move forward with with the, with the task force and do inventories and, and continue to work with the part our community partners and HUD TA there might be I don't I don't have anything right now um, but that could be something that comes from this as well that's good to know and obviously it is very early I would just um, be really interested in knowing because I think a lot of this uh, as this work continues on, I'm sure in HHS, you're going to see it, Councillor, quite a bit. Folks are going to have recommendations and thoughts of what the council can and should maybe try doing. Uh, and so while I have nothing in mind right now, I'm looking forward to the community leadership that you've created the space for. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Other questions or comments? Councillor Phillips? I just have a really quick question. Um, so there are six or seven individual teams that's correct yes um and then there's the one big i call it a stakeholders meeting the quite the entire crisis team uh a response team how often are they meeting that whole group um that whole group we are going to do regular check-ins we haven't set that i mean our the the leadership command staff the leaders of the different groups will be meeting multiple times a week. Um, but just this morning, I sent an email out to that large group, giving them an update. So constant communication about um, what is happening and what to expect uh, will be at least weekly with that group, I would say. Um, it might not be a full meeting, but even an email communication. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, Councillor Ali? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's not so much of a question. I want to thank uh, um, uh, Ms. Dow for the work that she put in, and thank you and the manager for uh, continuously going to Augusta. Um, I should have say what I'm going to say now during the uh, announcement section of the meeting. I think uh, last week I attended, I represented the council at the GP COG meeting, and uh, um, um, Director Dow and uh, her colleague uh, were uh, recognized for the work that they've done, not just for Portland, but for the whole region. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Director Dow, thank you for everything you do. You know, I'm a big supporter of you and your staff. So um, I think some of the comments made by my colleagues are insightful and helpful. And I too uh, appreciate the efforts that Councillor Fournier and her team have done in providing space uh, for some of these meetings so we can get to the agenda, the real agenda of the day. So I'm going to make a request of you is that uh, I'll be looking in the weeks that have had hopefully fewer weeks than many for some sense of how this response team will triage their engagement of the various encampments in the city. I appreciate um, Councilor Zaro's marathon metaphor, but if it's in your front yard or next to your business, they're not feeling like it should be a marathon. So I think we always have to be conscious that for some in our community, there's a certain immediacy to the presence of the unhoused and the threat that they feel from it being there. I recognize that some of them are clients uh, and need proper intervention to address whatever challenges they're experiencing. But I think it's incumbent on me as a counselor to also speak to those who are experiencing, their lived experience of the unhoused is unsettling, disconcerting, feels like a threat. So we have a community education challenge, but I think it's important at some juncture, at least we could give them a glimpse of how you and your team collectively will address that triage process because they feel all we've done is reallocate the unhoused tent cities into smaller fragments. And I understand why we did that, 
So I, I think we, it's incumbent on us to communicate how we're gonna move forward, not only in, in engaging the larger 10 uh, cities that are now coming into existence or, or have existed in the city, but the smaller ones as well, because they're just as disruptive to the uh, home neighborhood that they find themselves within. So I just wanna make sure we strike that balance. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. I just wanted to jump in for for one second on that because I just want to set um, expectations uh, very clearly on what this crisis response team is doing. They will be responding once we've specifically identified a um, encampment that's reached a certain level of public health and safety issues. They will respond individually to those. So it's not to address every single encampment in the city. It will almost be like on a case by case basis once an encampment has reached a certain tipping point, I would say, for lack of a better term. So I think that, um, but with that said, when th this is why I, I feel very strongly that we had to do the listening session and why I saw it to have that happen, because I want to hear from the public and I want to hear what their concerns are, what you just articulated, Councillor Diane. And then um, at the same time, I'm, I'm also convening a, a um, what I've called the strategic planning uh, meeting after our leadership meeting, which involves all the departments that are um, specifically involved and impacted and try to think of ways in which and be creative about how we can get our arms around this issue, which is a much broader issue than this. And I think to, to go to what Councillor Zaro said, it is a marathon and it's gonna, it, it is gonna be unsatisfying. I'm not gonna lie for a little while here where we're not gonna have answers for everybody right away. Um, we're really, it's taken us a while to get here and we're really trying hard to, to figure this out. We have lots of bills, as the mayor mentioned in Augusta. We have lots of um, different strategies that I think we're trying to implement. One of them is the crisis response team. Um, additionally, we're also thinking about ways in which to develop housing. There's a significant amount of money this council has put into um, the housing trust fund. And so that can be helpful. And then also trying to think um, creatively, like I said, just out of the box. I mean, this is a one hour meeting that we're doing every week. And um, I told the team at the beginning that I want you to come in with any idea and we're just going to start spitballing, throwing them up on the chalkboard and see, thinking about, you know, what can we do that? Let's try this. Let's try that. Because we are trying to focus on this. This is something that we know impacts the public, impacts the uh, individuals, the unhoused individuals themselves and impacts almost every department that the city has um, right now. So it's a big issue and it's one that we're very committed to. I think the, as the mayor mentioned, the representation that we had across the board from all departments in the city at the first meeting um, of your crisis response team, it, it, was, it was astounding to me. And so I think we're gonna try, but I, I do wanna set expectations very clearly that it's gonna take us a little while to get there. I would just add one thing to to um, just talking about communication. Um, we worked with um, Jessica Grandin, our communications director, to develop um, a web a page on the website that talks about our response to homelessness. The encampment um, crisis response team has a page on that, and we're going to be working to develop that as the um, encampment crisis response team develops too. So that will be another way for us to communicate with the public on what it is we are doing and um, our response as well. But the city manager was correct with the way. Councilor right. Diane, you've got the floor. Thank you. I'm not being critical manager. All right. I'm just offering a critique that exists in the community and I just, it's important to address that. That's all. So, I mean, if if you want to call it a tipping point, I'm okay with that. I just think when we do hold this listening session, people are going to come in and they're not all going to possess a marathon perspective. They're going to have a perspective that's linked to a certain immediacy. And I'm just asking that we be prepared to have some reasonable explanation as to what we do in the immediate sense, as well as the long term. This is almost an intractable problem. So I agree with you. There's no one way out of this, all right? But I think there has to be some parallel initiatives to be considered during a spitball 
<laughs> spitball sessions. I like that. Um, that's all. I mean, I just can't. Maybe I'm a contrarian sometimes, but I just can't get on and say, okay, it's a marathon. We're all set. Go ahead. Do what you got to do. I, I think people elect me to also speak to their concerns and they have a different perspective. And I just want to be able to put it out on the table so that we can work with it. But please take it as a critique of how we might move forward, not a criticism, because I, I've been an ardent supporter of DHHS leadership and more importantly, their point of service staff on how they've been trying to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess uh, first thing I'll say is um, since the letter to the governor is not a council um, action mm -hmm. item, I um, just want to go on the record um, and saying that I am certainly in support of this letter and I appreciate the work that went into it. Um, so I'm glad to see it going out. Um, then Dr. Tao just wanted to say, and in back of what the city manager just said, we had the conversation about, you know, ultimately housing a lot of these individuals is an unattainable goal. So mitigating the health and risk, um, you know, concerns that are coming out of the encampments being the goal. So I'm, I'm glad that we kind of reiterated that. Um, we, we talked also about having some sort of um, measurement or, or gauge of what is that, um, you know, what when does that encampment become um, a, a health and safety concern that requires the task force to come in? And then when does the task force then say, okay, we, we've got to physically move because, you know, like I said, we cannot house folks. We're not going to get rid of the encampments. People need to be really clear about that because there just isn't enough places to house the folks. So again, how do we objectively measure whether or not there is a health and safety concern? So we actually talked about that at the, the last week after um, our meeting and we talked about the metrics. So what metrics have to be met uh, in order for us to, to determine, because that's when we determine, okay, what, what encampment will we be looking at? Um, you know, it is really in terms of scope and size. And I know you're looking for very clear mm -hmm. concrete right now. And, and we are we are still developing that, but it is something that is on, um, on, uh, on something we are focusing on. It's really about the size of the encampment, the number of calls for service at the encampment. Um, I definitely am taking in um, provider feedback as well, because the people who are on the ground out there every single day working with uh, the individuals who are unhoused, they'll know where where we should focus our efforts. And they they definitely said that the Four River Parkway uh, encampment was was where we should uh, one of the ones where we should definitely start focusing our efforts on. So that is another thing. But uh, we will have a much more concrete metric uh, to go by. But yeah, that we are definitely working on that. I appreciate it. And just to, I'm, I don't think that I, I right now expected, uh, you know, that level of um, detail. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to to help frame the conversation because, as we said, you know, we need to be clear about what is the task force uh, expected to accomplish um, and just communicate it clearly. So I, I appreciate that at this point, we don't have that level of detail, but I did want to frame the conversation into what we really are trying to do. And I guess when we have that listening session, I'm sure we will all process what we hear from the community based on the reality of what we can actually achieve through the task force. So again, continuing to talk to the community about the challenges that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Kristen, something optimistic happened last week when I was at that meeting and there was discussion about um, actually some folks who had been in the Homeless Services Center who had been housed and therefore making space at the Homeless Services Center for people who are in tents. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, as you all know, we started our prevention and diversion program, which is located at 39 Forest Avenue. And the way our, our shelter works now um, at the Homeless Services Center is, and ever since we've opened the Prevention and Diversion Program, you go to the Prevention and Diversion Program, and if there's a bed available, then we will move you over to the Homeless Services Center. It's really a case-by-case -case basis right now when we're full. Like, there might be a bed available, there might not be. And we were noticing that there were a lot of people who are unhoused who are not accessing beds because of that format. So we... Um, started working with really closely with our service providers uh, to identify those who, specifically who are unhoused in the community who we know are sleeping out who would be interested in uh, in a bed if it became available. 
And we did that about two weeks ago, really targeted. And in two weeks, um, we were able to have, bring 17 people in from um, um, sleeping outside and encampments into the shelter. So, and just the, this today, staff called me and said, I, I can't believe it. We have six female beds available and one male bed available. And so they were working with service providers uh, to get six women uh, uh, who are unhoused in to the HSC, as well as uh, one, one gentleman. And so one might make the leap that there, with those beds opening at the Homeless Services Center, people are either finding family to be with, uh, a housing situation. Can you talk a little bit about that? What happens to those people who vacate a bed at the HSC? Absolutely. I mean, as, as shelter beds become available, it's because someone no longer needs emergency shelter, which means that they have you know, moved on with a family member or have found permanent housing um, or have found some transitional housing, whatever the case may be, but they're no longer able, they no longer need uh, emergency shelter. So as one be fed becomes available, it's a success story uh, of someone else being housed. So that really struck me because we, the fact is we don't have enough housing. We know that we don't have enough emergency shelter beds. We know that, but there is great work happening. And those data points are important. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you, you know, if you're, if you're able to share at this point, how will you be able to communicate to the council and to the community that kind of movement that's happening? Because this encampment crisis response team is all about moving folks from um, being outdoors to, to getting a shelter bed. And so, um, how will you be able to communicate that to us? Because I, I, you're good at this work and it's happening as we speak. And, and I know we'd all love to learn more about that. Yeah, I will. I talked about it a little bit at our meeting last week that I really want to work with the service providers. I, we'd love to have a dashboard on, the, on that website that we um, have. But I want to be very mindful to protect those that uh, are unhoused. So what information we share, we wanna, we wanna share information with the community to let people know, but we wanna be careful about what exactly inf information we are sharing. So we are gonna work with our community providers. We'll definitely be sharing the data um, and, and creating a dashboard of some sort. I'm just not sure what that data and information will look like. I know your, your plate is full, but I wanted to, I wanted to highlight the fact that you did share great information last week about about movement, and I think that that's significant. Um, I guess I'll just wrap up by saying, um, what I think what we all know is that um, the work of this encampment crisis response team um, is critical, and it's not going to be as fast as as we'd all like it to be. Um, but it's 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 happening, and it's critical, um, and it's a piece of the work, and it can't be the only thing. We continue to need help from other towns and cities, from the region, from the state. And so um, I, I, I think it's just terribly important to underscore as we make our way through various responses that the city of Portland is leading or implementing that uh, the need is growing continually and we, and we need more help. So um, thank you. And I look to my colleagues on the council to see if there's any more discussion. Okay, I don't see any, so we will wrap up this communication. Um, and again, thanks for being here. Uh, and we just have a few more things on our agenda tonight. We move into the resolution section. Will the clerk please read Resolve 9? Resolve 9, 22, 23, reaffirming a sister city relationship with Capetian Haiti, sponsored by Pius Ali, Councillor. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Councillor Ali to share the content of these, this resolution before us this evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think uh, in uh, on September 18, 2002, uh, the City of Portland and uh, the City Council voted to pass a resolution, Resolve 3203, supporting the establishment of a sister city relationship with Cap Haitian Haiti. This resolution seeks to reaffirm the City of Portland's commitment to that resolution. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to read it, and then I will share uh, a, a request from the uh, Combisante group. Resolution reaffirming a sister city relationship with Cap Haitian Haiti. Whereas Combisante is a Portland-based nonprofit healthcare organization established in 2001 for the purpose of developing a sustainable healthcare system 
to meet the need of the Carpathian community. And whereas Carpathian has been a sister city of the city of Portland since the passage of Resolve 30203 on September 18, 2002, when this Haitian port city had a population of 150,000 and today has a population estimated to be 190,000. And whereas relationship established through Maine's volunteer work at Combisante have developed a broader exchange program with Cap Haitians residents, including cultural, educational, and governmental interactions. And whereas Cap Haitian and the rest of Haiti are now experiencing an unprecedented political crisis leading to many disruptions, not least in its ability to care for the healthcare of its people. And whereas deteriorating security and port of prince has disrupted food and fuel supplies around the country and inflation has reached an unprecedented high and makes life even harder for the majority of Haitians. And whereas Combisante is celebrating its work and international connection with a virtual event called Stand with Haiti, Move with Combi Sante, which starts on June 1st and continues to July 31st, 2023, in order to raise funds for its work, delivering medical supplies and improving healthcare in Northern Haiti. And now therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and the city council reaffirm the city of Portland's sister city relationship with Cap Haitian, as well as its partnership with Combisante and commit to celebrating and depending the connection between the two cities. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the executive director of Combisante happens to be someone that did work for the uh, city of Portland a few years ago. And she did request that um, uh, if we can, uh, some of us should set up a profile on the fundraising. And I am going to do that. I am going to speak to uh, State Senator Joe Dusin, who happens to be the mayor when this was uh, um, established to see if she will join me. And I'm inviting my colleagues on the council to see if any of you is interested so that we can support uh, the people of Haiti. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Um, and this is an action before the council tonight. This is a, um, we'll, we'll be looking for a, uh, approval on the resolution. So uh, with that, I go out and see if there's any public comment on Resolve 9. George Rowe, uh, West Bayside. I uh, got off a plane around 3.30 today and I was looking forward to participating by Zoom, but you guys made that impossible apparently. Um, so my questions about this, um, uh, resolve uh, is anybody from actually the sister city cap Haitian itself uh, been communicated with in any regard obviously uh, the country of Haiti is still in a great deal of turmoil um, I literally uh, walked by a, a newspaper in an airport uh, in the last 24 hours that had a big front page story about um, literally uh, neighborhoods having to band together to fight off uh, criminal gangs. And again, it's not clear exactly who is the good guy, whether it's the vigilantes or whether it's the criminal gangs. So um, I think this is a great gesture. If we've had a, a relationship that's been dormant or that's been uh, set aside for a long time, there's no better time than National Caribbean Heritage Month uh, to restore that relationship and renew it. But it should be a, a real renewal and not just a uh, symbolic thing. Um, earlier tonight, it's very clear that uh, Portland is struggling with a lot of things that your attention, in my opinion, is not nearly focused on enough. Um, as evident by the fact that in some cases you don't even have questions to ask about what's going on in our own city, but yet you are reaching out to other parts of the world. Again, hopefully we can have more balls in the air than just one at a time, but it really concerns me that this is, uh, you know, symbol over substance, that there isn't really necessarily a, uh, uh, a real constituency in Haiti 
or in this community that is really directing this and providing a real meaningful you know, next step. We had a relationship with a port city in Russia. Um, and of course, for various reasons, very little ever happened with that. And now it's even more clouded because we don't really second warning. have diplomatic relations with Russia because of the uh, war in Ukraine. So again, please, what can the city council do? You often are asked, we can't do everything, but yet you have the time to do things like this. And if it's just a piece of paper, I really wish you could focus your attention in some other place. And again, there are ways to celebrate and nurture our relationship with the Caribbean and with Haiti, but maybe this isn't it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment on Resolve 9? Okay, I don't see any on Zoom or in person, so I will close public comment and I'm gonna come back to the council uh, for a motion, please. Passage. Second, Councillor Ali and a second from Councillor Fournier. Um, any discussion questions, Councillor Ali? I was gonna, I was gonna ask you to talk a little bit about the um, the connection that you have and the request that came to you to sponsor this for us tonight. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think I I uh, received an email from uh, Tazita. Is her name? She used to work for uh, City of Portland's Public Health Department. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that she was for uh, Compisante. Uh, in that email, she copied uh, two individuals. Who are the one is the retired executive director and the other one is the founder uh, of Compensante, who both live in Maine. And uh, I met with her, and she told me that this is why they are doing, and they want the support from uh, from the city. And so I refer her to uh, the city manager's office, and we work with her to uh, do this uh, reaffirmation. I think um, uh, they have an uh, interest in uh, reviving uh, or. Uh, uh, the connection between um, Cape, Cape Hessian and Portland uh, in the next few years, next few months. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor. Did you have a comment beyond that? I'm sorry, I thought I saw your hand go up and then I interrupted you. Uh, no, with I, the question. Okay. Uh, but I would <laughs> love to thank them and um, thank city, city staff for uh, doing this. Great. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments from the Council? Okay, seeing none, we can go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Resolve 9 passes unanimously. We did postpone Order 224 under unfinished business until our next meeting on June 26th. So we have just a couple of um, orders before us tonight. Um, before we have some first reads, will the clerk please read order 238. Order 238, 22, 23, accepting the Cumberland County and City of Portland analysis of impediments for fa to fair housing sponsored by the Housing and Economic Development. Uh, Councillor Pius Ali, Chair. Uh, thank you. And Councillor Ali, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, uh, normally I think Mary should have spoken to it. And since Mary is not, or she may be on Zoom or not, I don't know. Um, Manny, do you want to speak to it? Uh, I don't see Mary on Zoom. Oh, there she is. Oh, she's up. She's up. I'm sorry, Mary. Right. I'm looking at my attendee list. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna hope for the best here. Good evening, counselors. Can you hear me? There we go. This is our first since we had our break, and we are still unable to hear you. Can is that? Go ahead. Try okay. try again, Mary. Good evening, counselors. Try again. Good evening, counselors. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. Good evening, counselors. My name is Mary Davis. I'm the housing uh, interim housing and economic development director. Um, as a recipient of funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the City of Portland and the Cumberland County Home Consortium are required to comply with uh, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, known as the Fair Housing Act. The act requires recipients of federal funds 
to affirmatively further the policies and purposes of the Fair Housing Act. Um, the obligation to affirm affirmatively further fair housing requires that recipients of HUD funds like Portland and Cumberland County um, that we take meaning, meaningful actions to overcome patterns of segregation and foster, foster inclusive communities, free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity based on protected characteristics, which are race, color, national origin, religion, sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, familial status and disability. Um, the planning process that we use to identify these barriers is called the analysis of impediments to fair housing. Um, the process evaluates um, various things like zoning and land use, pri private sector loan practices, and a review of community demographics to identify areas of opportunity to increase fair housing. Um, the process is generally undertaking, undertaken as part of the required HUD consolidated planning process. Um, the City of Portland and Cumberland County, as members of the Cumberland County Home Consortium, jointly contracted with a consulting firm named Root Policy to undertake this analysis. Root Policy analyzed local zoning and land uses, conducted a survey, and held several focus groups to identify the barriers within Cumberland County and the city of Portland. Um, Heidi Aguilar from Root Policy is here with us um, and would be will be available to answer questions as we go forward. Um, the consultants completed extensive countywide outreach to municipal staff, residents with lived experience, and organiz organizations representing underserved communities. Groups and organizations that responded and spoke with the consultant included town leaders, planning and economic development staff from communities throughout Cumberland County, public sector providers such as Pine Tree Legal Assistance, Community Housing of Maine, Portland Housing Authority, Westbrook Housing Authority, Cumberland County Public Health, and Portland Social Service Division, Alpha One, Disability Rights of Maine, New England ADA Center, Opportunity Alliance. The city's Office of Economic Opportunity assisted the consultant with outreach to organizations supporting BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus organizations and people living with disabilities. This outreach effort resulted in focus group with, with a, in a focus group with seven particip participants for women, single parents, and seniors. Focus groups for the BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus communities were scheduled with two organizations signed up to attend um, the BIPOC focus group and one person signed up for the LGBTQIA plus focus group. However, no one attended either, either of these group meetings. A member of the consultants team was able to speak with several monolingual Spanish speakers. The city Zen City, formerly civil, civil space platform, was used to gather survey data. 40% of respondents were from renter households, and 8% were respondents who were per precariously housed. Um, the report identifies actions the city and region can take to alleviate the identified barriers. The Fair Housing Action Plan matrix, um, which is in the packet backup, outlines the action items for Portland and Cumberland County specifically, as well as action items for two for the two organizations jointly. At a high level, these include increasing the supply of affordable housing, addressing gaps in home ownership attainment, and addressing barriers to equalizing access to opportunity. Um, I won't read through each of the recommendations, but I'm happy to answer questions, any questions you may have. And um, as I mentioned, Heidi is here with us to answer qu any questions that you may have as well. Thank you very much for that um, thorough re uh, introduction. And I will at this time ask for any public comment on order 238. Uh, George Rowe, West Bayside. Um, I think that uh, I had put in a public comment while I was traveling actually this weekend, um, just pointing out just literally just randomly flipping through the pages of this very large uh, set of documents in front of you on this agenda item, that it's, it's just a lot of mistakes and a lot of bad history and a lot of distorted history. 
Um, and it's a shame because I'm pretty sure these consultants, you know, were, were earnest and were trying to do a good job and um, a lot of money was spent. But this flew under the radar. I don't remember, uh, I'm not a big social media person, I don't remember any counselor on this council back uh, uh, when this started or since uh, highlighting how important this exercise is and how uh, involved they wanted this community to be and uh, digging deep into this exercise. And, you know, there's little things, little facts, like did the Portland Renewal Authority have anything to do with Union Station getting demolished in 1961? The answer is no, but yet somehow this report says that they were. Um, but, you know, when they get little facts like that wrong, it really questions who was advising them, where were they getting their information? We already heard uh, in Ms. Davis's introduction that there were attempts to have community outreach that basically literally produced almost nothing. And there's re references again and again to stakeholders and individuals being quoted, literally quoted, but none of them are identified. We have no idea exactly what the uh, or a universe of people that inform this report. And it doesn't name names. It doesn't name all of you in the city that has literally produced blocks after blocks after blocks of housing opportunities in most of the city. And a great example is right now, there is a huge site that Maine Med just sold in the West End on West and Carlton. It is um, almost 40,000 square feet. And right now there's nine luxury homes that are slated to be redeveloped on that entire lot, including the redevelopment and renewal of a historic carriage house. You guys also have before the planning board a proposal for almost the exact same size parcel of land for 200 units of affordable housing. And that is going into Bayside. So there's your racism, there's your segregation, 201 units down the hill, near the highway, far away. The nice neighborhood, the West Enders, District 2, the promised land, the oasis, they get nine units of luxury housing and they don't have to take any burdens of traffic or congestion or new neighbors. They get the pick of the lot and a $2 million new family who can afford that. So this is a meaningless exercise. You've made it that way. Thank you, George. And it's 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 wrong. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any additional public comment on order 238 this evening? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna ask for a council, a motion from the council. So moved. And a second. Second. Councillor Zara with the second. Councillor Ali with the motion. Councillor Zara with the second. Um, the action before us tonight is to accept this analysis of the Cumberland County and City of Portland impediments to fair housing. I look to my colleagues for discussion. Any questions, comments, Councillor Fournier? Thank you. Um, I guess my first question is, if we're accepting this now, where does it go? So one of the recommendations right off the bat is um, that there is um, a denial of rental housing to housing choice voucher holders. That seems like a very clear, like identified issue. So now where does that go? Who takes that up? Who starts to work on that? Who starts to create approvals instead of denials? So I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear. I'm happy to accept the report and dive into it, but what I think to the public comment um, point is, we get a lot of these very robust studies, which are wonderful, full of lots of information, but I think we're all frustrated by the lack of housing. So if we get a very large report like this, I'm just curious kind of if we could outline what are the next steps or where where does this go? Thank you, Councillor. Do you want to do you want to address that or should I look to Mary? Mary, I'm gonna I'm gonna give that to you. I know you discussed this in committee. So if you wouldn't mind answering Councillor Fournier's question, that would be great. Certainly. Um, so the uh, Fair Housing Action Plan matrix that I mentioned, um, which is in the pot in the backup packet, um, lays out action items for the City of Portland and Cumberland County individually and um, 
as uh, the two organizations together. And so we'll be working on um, and HUD will require us to address these actions and to report um, the, um, the work that we do to um, take up these items and find solutions and implement those solutions on those items. Um, typically, we report in our um, annual action plan to HUD and our consolidated annual performance evaluation reports um, the accomplishments that we achieve um, on these action plan items. Thank you. Any follow up on that? Okay. Any other questions or comments from the council? Councilor Ali? Uh, thank you, Mary. Mary, I have a question. When do you have to do this? How often do you do this exercise? Um, the exercise is typically part of the consolidated planning process, which happens um, essentially every five years. If you'll recall, we completed um, that process last year, and um, due to a variety of, of reasons, uh, this plan is following a year behind. So um, essentially, it's an every five-year process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Other questions, comments from the council? Councilor Zorro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll be brief. I just am um, curious, Mary, if I understood correctly when you answered Councilor Fournier's question about additional reporting and, and making sure we are you know, diligent in, in following the newly adopted uh, you know, standards, does HUD then correspond, does that correspond with you know, additional funding from HUD? I, I'm just trying to connect the dots on, on on the now what, <laughs> right? Like what, what, what does this, other than giving you more reporting to do, um, do, you, do you get, you know, what's the incentive? What's the carrot that you're getting here? Um, the, this is a requirement of um, receiving the entitlement grants that the city already receives, the community development block grant and the home program grant. Um, so there really isn't any additional funding. There's no new carrot or extra carrot that we get. Um, it's a way that we identify um, what the goals and priorities are for the um, program that, that we're already administering and the funds and grants that we're already administering. Oh, it's not working at all. I think we're having microphone issues tonight. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. Oh. Thanks, Peter. I think we're good. Okay, thank you, Councilor Zorro. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote to accept um, this uh, analysis. Councilor Cornyn? Yes. Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Peter, did you mute everybody again? Councilor Zorro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Councilor Phillips. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Order 238 passes unanimously. We have one more action item before we get to a, several first reads. So I'm hoping our mics can hang in here through this one um, last action item for the council. Will the clerk please read order 239? Order 239, 22, 23, approving changes to the tax increment financing policy sponsor. By the Housing and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Piasali Chair. And again, Councillor, I'll go to you first. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will refer you to Mary again. Uh, I'm sure that she's here this time around. She is. <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, City of Portland Tax Increment Financing Policy requires um, firms employed in the construction phase of a TIF-assisted project. Um, so this would be an um, organization receiving uh, tax increment financing through a credit enhancement agreement. Um, contractors uh, involved in the construction phase of that project have to compensate employees using the greater of state prevailing wage rates in Portland min or Portland minimum wage during the construction. Um, many of the affordable housing projects receiving a TIF credit enhancement agreement 
also ha uh, have other funding sources also, which require the use of federal Davis-Bacon wage rate requirements. The double requirement can be costlier for affordable housing developers, both in reporting time and in practice. Of the 17 active affordable housing TIF districts, 13 projects have been, are, or will be subject to wage conditions, which requires the greater state prevailing wages or Portland minimum wage to be used during construction. Um, as I mentioned, several of these projects also have other funding sources, as, such as project-based vouchers, which require the federal Davis-Bacon wages to be used. The Davis-Bacon wage rates and state prevailing wage rates are different in terms of labor classifications and wages paid to each classification. These differences can make it challenging for contractors to identify the appropriate classification and wage determination for each worker. There are cases in which the Davis-Bacon wage rates are higher than state prevailing wages and vice versa. For projects required to use both determinations, developers are paying significantly more than a project required to use either Davis-Bacon or state prevailing wage. To decrease the burden on affordable housing projects, staff is proposing the following changes to section B3III uh, of the TIF policy. The current language reads, any firms employed in the construction phase of a TIF assisted project must compensate all employees the current wage rates and fringe benefits as required under applicable state preva prevailing wage law. Um, the proposed language would be um, any firms employed in the construction phase of a TIF assisted project must compensate all employees the current wages and fringe benefits as required under applicable, applicable state prevailing wage law. If a project is required to use Davis-Bacon wages as a result of another funding source, Davis-Bacon wage rates will suffice to meet this requirement, provided the minimum wage for each job is greater than the Portland City Ordinance. Um, the TIF policy with the proposed changes is included in the backup. Um, these revisions will lower the costs and administrative burdens of developing affordable housing in Portland while still ensuring workers um, on these projects uh, receive fair wages. Uh, we have included in the backup information from three developers who provided data of how the requirement to use both Davis-Bacon and prevailing wage has affected their projects. In addition to the analysis provided by these developers, we have anecdotally heard from contractors and developers that it can greatly complicate projects to use two different wage requirements on one job. For one project, the overall cost to the pro project for state prevailing wage requirements, in addition to Davis-Bacon, is approximately 75 to 100,000. The labor classifications do not line up, um, and that can cause difficulty in, in identifying the appropriate worker classification. Um, the developer also analyzed actual wages being paid and noted that in 70% of cases, the actual wages paid to workers exceeded the Davis-Bacon and state prevailing wage rates. From a city administrative perspective, um, housing and community development staff are currently managing 77 affordable housing development project, projects. This number includes projects that have received some type of city financial assistance, including affordable housing TIF financing, and are in various forms of completion from those that are currently occupied and being monitored for long-term affordable housing compliance to those in the pre-construction phase. And this does not include any projects that may be awarded funding in the 2023 allocation process. At this time, 22 projects are in the pre-construction, construction, or post-construction rent-up phase. Um, we have two HCD staff reviewing certified payrolls. Um, from May 8 through May 30, they received more than 350 certified payrolls that required review and approval. These payrolls are from affordable housing development projects only and do not include any payrolls received for CDBG construction related projects. On average, um, 
these staff are spending each about 10 hours per week on wage rate requirements, including developer and contractor training, document production, interviews, and payroll reviews. Um, and uh, so this recommendation is brought before you um, with the request that the uh, council adopt the amendment. Thank you very much for that, Mary. I appreciate it. Is there any public comment on order 239? Uh, comment triggered something in me um, about the staff time being uh, being utilized, and that is, does this change eliminate the need for that staff time? Because it, it wasn't really clear there. But you know, is, is that what we're basically uh, a save on on city staff time and on developer staff time in having to prepare all these reports? Is that what this change is going to accomplish? Thanks. Thank you for your question, your public comment. Any other public comment? Hi there, Nate Howes with Avesta Housing. Um, I want to speak to this item tonight. It's kind of a rare opportunity when we get to see um, something made simplified in the affordable housing world. Uh, we deal with a lot of resources, sometimes as many eight in the capital stack. They all have contradictory, sometimes, um, duplicative requirements. And this is a great example of that, where you have wage rates, two different wage rates that have to be complied with um, because of one affordable housing TIF. And they're contradictory in some cases. And as uh, Mary was saying, 70% of the wages are actually above the Davis-Bacon threshold. So I think this change is a great way to simplify the process. I would have loved if the original legislation had just been written to Davis Bacon. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> we used to avoid Davis Bacon uh, like like crazy. We would try to avoid having to uh, do Davis Bacon just because it's so much of a reporting requirement. Um, but this situation is actually worse than that. So we would rather have Davis Bacon to comply with than trying to figure out which wage rate we need to comply with with this dual system. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Additional public comment, either on Zoom or in person. Seeing none, I'll close public comment on order 239 and come back to the council, please, for a motion. Second. Councilor Ali with a second from Councilor Rodriguez, and I look to the council for discussion. Uh, Councilor Diane. I just want to say when Mary briefed us out on it, I, I concur with the gentleman from the Vesta and other comments, I mean, I really had to think about this in trying to balance both wage models, all the collateral reporting that has to occur. You know, there's an assumption in some quarters that folks are not getting paid appropriately. And then you wonder why it requires a fleet of lawyers to come in and try to sort out what might be the facts. So I support it because it's one model. I'm not sure it's going to save any money. I don't like making those kinds of promises, but I think it'll make it more efficient for both partners, both the developer and the city in terms of managing their relationship and being clear about expectations around labor questions. That often comes up when we want to spend money or we're participatory in the financing is, what is labor going to get paid? Is it fair? We can have an intelligent conversation now under this proposed model. So I think it makes administrative sense for all the parties involved. And if we should save some money, that's a wonderful benefit. But I think we're gonna save a lot of headaches, confusion, and frustration. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Dion. Other com I wanna do my best to get to the question that was asked during public comment. I think the spirit of the question and please anybody jump in and correct me if I'm wrong here, is, is the efficiency making for city staff or for developer staff? My sense that it's for both, but Mary, if you have any comment there, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, there is a, um, a whole issue around efficiency. So in some cases, developers are hiring um, outside firms to help them manage this process. Um, if we are using uh, one wage rate, 
um, you don't have to do the cross reference. And this is for every, not only general contractors, but every subcontractor involved in a job. So essentially that means you do the cross reference every time a new subcontractor um, steps on site. And so um, developers are spending time with their contractors, they're hiring um, outside firms to help them meet this compliance. Then from a staff perspective, we're also trying to um, double check and make sure that the proper wage has been paid. Um, and once you have done that initial review for a subcontractor, it's easy to re easier to review their remaining uh, payrolls as they come in um, on a weekly basis. But you have to do that with each subcontractor. So I do believe it's going to save time for both um, city staff and for the developer. And just as an aside, we're looking at ways to make the process that we use in our office more efficient um, so that um, uh, we can free up staff time to do some of the other work that needs to be done. Thank you, Mary. Okay, uh, Councillor Zorro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm almost there. This one's pretty confusing. Mary, are the costs that you were referencing, are the added costs that you were referencing simply because of the administrative overhead, trying to reconcile those two uh, wage rates? Um, no, it's not only the administrative overhead. There's the difference in the wage rates between the two um, uh, two forms, whether it's the Davis-Bacon or the state prevailing wage. In some cases, uh, as I mentioned, one is higher than the other. And so it, using one or the other increases the cost to a project. Um, not every project is required to pay Davis-Bacon wage rates. Um, and so in those cases, they would use the state prevailing wage. But in the case of a project where they have other financing sources that are requiring, requiring them to meet Davis-Bacon, they would be able to use just that one source. Okay, thank you. I think um, I'm just trying to understand if this adoption is is this overall have you been able to crunch numbers on overall how is this going to impact work workers wages because one minute i was reading this and i was thinking oh this looks like this is actually going to increase and then i read it again i was like wait it looks like it could potentially decrease you look at the part where it's you know for carpenters it was 13 13 an hour higher than stay prevailing wages while electricians wages were 778 higher in state prevailing wage than in Davis Bacon. So do you have a general like catch all uh, or is it really industry trade specific? Um, it's a good question. I don't have an um, overall catch all to say that it's going to, um, as far as dollar wise, impact projects um, at a specific amount. There are cases where um, one wage rate is higher than the other, and um, you know cases where the state prevailing wage is higher than Davis Bacon, or Davis Bacon is higher than state prevailing wage. Um, so there are going to be cases where they're all going to be paid um, either through the federal prevailing wage or the state prevailing wage. So there are going to be prevailing wage rates used. Um, there will be cases um, where the use of the state prevailing wage might have provided um, the uh, workers with a higher wage. There'll be cases where um, using the Davis-Bacon wage would, would pay the worker a higher wage. Um, so I can't give you a definit definitive dollar amount. I, I appreciate you entertaining it. I think my, my last question would be, and this is just, now I'm throwing the spitball on ideas, city manager. You gave me ideas, you. Um, is there ever a scenario in which, because we're talking about affordable housing here and that we want, we want to increase affordable housing. Um, is there ever an opportunity to 
mitigate those added costs through the Jill Dusan Housing Trust Fund that we have over $9 million in. I think my my hesitation, my only hesitation is I, I just don't want to be responsible for lowering wages for any workers. And I and I don't know if that's what we're doing, but it feels like there's a possibility. And maybe I've just overthought this too much, but um but uh yeah, that's that's where I'm at. I think there might have been a question in there for Mary. Um, I think in essence we are um, seeing the impacts of those um, additional costs. Um, we see higher requests for um, subsidy through either our home program or housing trust fund um, program. Um, we see higher requests for the percentage of the credit enhancement agreement that's returned to the developer. So I think we are compensating um, for those um, higher amounts. Um, being 100% honest, I can't tell you that uh, workers' wages won't be impacted um, by this change. Um, I think it's about the complexity of trying to put together affordable housing uh, deals and trying to find ways in which we can make it um, uh, easier for these deals to get in the ground and completed. Um, and um, this was uh, just one of many um, discussion points that we had in our office that we wanted to bring forward. Um, they're definitely, um, you know, like I said, I can't say that there won't be cases where workers may be paid uh, less than they would have with state prevailing wage. Um, there are probably cases where that will happen. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Councillor Zaro. Uh, Councillor Diane, over to you. Just want to make a comment. Um... We're speculating in economics, right? But let's put it out on the table. No matter which wage index you take, it's the best guess, right? We hope it's fair. There's argument for both sides. I support this proposition this evening because it consolidates the decision-making onto one index. Here's a second assumption, much like tonight, we passed the idea of closing lower exchange street. We're gonna have miraculous returns, hopefully, right? Better commerce, better relationships, less cars. There are alternative answers to all those suppositions. This allows the developer to say, okay, I've got one yardstick, but the yardstick doesn't control the labor market. Go hire some people that hang sheetrock right now or master electricians or craft plumbers. The market dictates what they really cost. What this does for the regulator, which in this case is the city, and for the developer is they will share a common yardstick in order to assess the wages that they're offering under a particular project. I don't think the market is of a nature today that'll support any employer with the idea is I'm gonna shave my labor costs right down to that floor. Okay, it's how far away from the floor am I actually going to have to go? So I think if we're willing to experiment with economics, we could do it with this and see what the result is. But I, I do believe it's more effective, it's more efficient, pick one or the other. And in this case, we've made a decision with the staff recommendation as to which yardstick to apply. But I'll be shocked if we read anything in the housing committee that suggests that wages are going to be cruising at the floor, you know, they're, they're willing to pay whatever right now to get anyone to do the trades. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have a question, Mary. Um, it has to do with these. Um, we, we want people to make good money and we want affordable housing. And so my, I understand the, 
um, the simplification and the using one benchmark um, appeal. I also want to know a little bit more about uh, how the complexity may serve as an impediment to project completion or even project uh, contemplation. So we don't want to slow down the um, development of affordable housing. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit so that we can understand how we how we look at these competing needs that we have, the need to pay people well and the need to build affordable housing. Um, so um, as Nate Howes from Avesta Housing mentioned, affordable housing is a uh, a complex endeavor anyway. Um, he mentioned that often there's uh, could be eight or more um, resources in the capital stack financing the project, each of which has different um, requirements that come with it. Um, the issue here with the different wage rates is um, that in some cases it does cost more um, to use the uh, state prevailing wage rate. Um, it's uh, administratively takes more time to ensure that the proper uh, wage rate in each job classification is being paid. Um, and so the more levels of complexity that we add to the resources that we have for affordable housing um, makes um, it more difficult to um, implement those resources. So, um, for instance, um, we it was mentioned tonight that we have $9 million in our housing trust fund. Our application is out um, and has been out since April, and we only have two applications in. There's There are a couple more that are being processed in our new um, online web portal, um, but we've only received two full applications since the application was released. Um, the complexity of just the regulations on the federal side with home, with the home funding, um, our local requirements for how we use our housing trust fund resources and um, the tax increment financing. Um, it's just all complexity that a developer has to take on when they're undertaking um, the affordable housing development. Um, I support um, the regulations that we have um, and ensuring that the city is making the best use of its resources and that we're using the resources to um, fill the needs and the and the gaps and the priorities that we've identified here in our community. Um, but if there are ways that we can make it easier for those resources to be allocated, um, in, you know, I support those. Um, so um, I think this is just one example of where we're trying to make sure um, that uh, the people are, are getting fair wages on um, the projects that we're investing in. Um, but maybe making it, uh, maybe making that too complicated. Um, again, not every, pro the federal Davis-Bacon wage rates are, um, are established on a nationwide basis. Um, and those are regulated by the federal government. Um, it's a well-known um, form of wage rate compliance. Um, uh, it's a resource that has been around for a long time and people are familiar with how that works. Um, the state prevailing wages um, are also a, a, a well-known product. And when state funding is invested in projects, they have to comply with that. The two systems determine what those wage rates, wage rates are um, very differently. And so the the data behind how those rates are are calculated are are very different. Um, so I think, from my perspective, it's um, we have a lot of resources, we have a lot of needs. Um, let's make the use of those resources um, as easy as possible while um, meeting the needs and the goals of the community. 
Uh, thanks, Mary. So just to summarize, I think what I'm hearing is that you and your team brought this forward for the committee's consideration in response to wanting and needing to simplify the process to build affordable housing. In the city of Portland, we've got two fair wage standards that create complexity. Um, potentially that complexity slows down the process to build affordable housing. I, I don't know if I've gotten that exactly right, but that's sort of, I, the fact that we have so many fewer applications than normal is concerning. I think that um, you know costs are high, we know that. I think there's complexity in the city of Portland. Um, but I, so I appreciate you and your team bringing forward um, creative solutions to try to encourage building affordable housing in the city of Portland. And it's, it's tricky. I'm stuck on the, you know, wanting to make sure that people get, um, get paid well. But as I, as I said, I think what we're doing here is we're talking about two fair wage standards and you're saying, let's pick, let's pick one of them to use as the benchmark. So, um, I appreciate where you're coming from and I understand it. Thank you. Other, Councillor Phillips, did you have your hand up? And then Councillor Pelletier. Uh, thanks, Mayor. <clears throat> um, when this this uh, when this was brought to the Housing and Economic Development Committee, um, uh, we asked several questions, um, one of them specifically about the wage. Um, and so I appreciate uh, Councillor Zaro um, asking so many questions because this is really and truly very confusing. Um, on this. And so, um, although, I, and I would also agree with you, May, that on the one hand, we want affordable housing. And on the other hand, I don't want anybody to lose any money. And so I do think we have to look at the economics um, because I do not want any, in this day and age, nobody should lose money. And I understand there's two different wage uh, sets and we're choosing one. Um, and we're going to hope that nobody loses any money. Um, and so I don't want to, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I, this is very complicated. Um, and um, I still need to be convinced that this is, that I, I should vote for it. Thank you, Councillor Pelletier. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know. I'm a little concerned. I guess I, I echo what was said about never wanting to slow down affordable housing, of course, but also worried about the wage decrease for workers if we move forward with this. And I guess I'm just thinking about we're trying to do a good move, but it could have a negative impact that could be really significant for, for workers. I don't know. I'm feeling, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I guess this is a little bit more challenging than I actually thought it would be. So I'm not sure. I'm thinking out loud. I don't really know how much more I have to have to add right now because I'm like processing this in real time, but I think I'm just a little bit concerned about moving forward in a direction where we feel like it may result in more affordable housing, but in doing so it may have the, a negative impact that none of us want. So um, yeah, that's where I am right now. Thank you, Councillor. Other comments before we move forward? Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mary, I have a few questions for you. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Mary, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Mary, uh, let's presume that um, we're not making these changes, right? And uh, you mentioned that there are two different type of uh, uh, wages that uh, people have to pay, correct? Correct. Okay. So uh, one is higher than the other. In some cases, yes. It's going to be hard because uh, I'm trying to mic her through my microphone. So if you could ask her your question and then I'll I'll put the mic down so she can respond um, rather than doing it in real time, that would be, that would be a, lot, a little easier for me. Yeah. So maybe in lieu of asking the questions, I am going to ask Corporation Council questions. Um, if we chose not to move this forward uh, because of the technicalities that we are having, think it's a, and say that um, we should move this like a postpone it to, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say something that is not good. 
kick down the can to this particular can to like two meetings um, uh, so that the conversation can be held in person or so that the questions that uh, my colleagues um, have, because at a committee level, we did have this discussion. And I think um, um, a, those of us who voted to move it forward did think that uh, by moving it forward, uh, it will be, it, it's not a perfect situation, but it will do more good than uh, not doing good. I think Councillor Phillips did raise the issue of uh, if people were going to lose money and Mary said, uh, if I remember, I don't think she said people will lose money. Um, I don't even know where I'm going with this. Uh, will, and to you, Councillor Phillips and Councillor uh, Pelletier, will some sort of like, a, which I don't think we have the space to do that, but some sort of like a workshop can help you? Councillor, can I just, um, I just want to weigh in on one little piece. I think that's important. This is just setting the minimum. Okay. And I think what Councillor Diane was saying was that we're always above the maximum. This is going to just reduce, I think what Mary was saying, it's going to reduce the amount of work for the developer and for staff to try to determine between which wage rate. Um, but it's just setting the base, not not as high. I mean, I think I think it would be really difficult. I don't want to speak for Mary for staff to try to determine specifically um, if workers would lose anything. And there there may be a situation. I think she was just trying to put out a caveat that there may be a situation that that happens, but it's going to be pretty few and far between, given the prevailing wages that are being paid right now for this type of work. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. All set, Councillor. Okay. Um, thank you. Other hands up from council members. Councillor Fournier. Thank you. It's just real quick on the reporting requirement. I think it had said that in the original um, policy that the report would be provided with an update of all of this um, annually. And so I'm wondering, normally all of it is done, I think, based on the previous one is in February. And so I don't know, would this be a year from today we'll get an update on this or would it be in the annual report in February? Mary, Mary, Mary. Um, so normally what we've been doing is we've been noting in the um, TIF annual report um, that whether or not the projects were in compliance with the wage rate requirements. The report doesn't include an, a detailed analysis um, by job classification or um, the comparison between the two. What we're trying to do here is that the state prevailing wage rate will still be the benchmark, except for those cases where a project also has to comply with Davis-Bacon wages. And one of the things that we've found um, is that in some cases, um, workers are being paid above both of those wage rates already um, because of the um, economic environment, the construction industry now where it is, um, all of those reasons workers are generally being paid higher than those two rates. Um, but we do the reporting in the annual TIF policy, but we don't do it in um, the detail um, for each job classification, and we're not doing a comparison with the Davis-Bacon wage rates. So I'm wondering just for this first one so that we understand the impact, is there a way to be able to break that down for this first annual report of making this change just so we can understand if there is any sort of adverse impact. I know that's a lot of work, Mary, I'm sorry, but I think just listening to everyone else's concerns just to make sure that there isn't an adverse impact. It sounds like really the market's going to be above this. And so I, I think it is a small concern, but I just wanna make sure to voice that. Mm -hmm. Mary, you wanna, do you wanna respond to that? Yeah, um, it, I would be really, um, I would be reluctant to say that that would be a task that we could take on. Um, so wage rates change. Um, the state prevailing wage rate changes, um, I think, only on an annual basis. But Davis-Bacon wage rates can change 
um, uh, multiple times throughout the year. So it'd be, we could take a snapshot in time and show you a comparison from that snapshot in time, but an overall actual um, uh, comparison for a real project in real time. Um, that would be um, a lot of work, and I'm not sure that we could provide you with the data that you're looking for. Thank you, Mary. Okay, other questions, comments from the council before we move to a vote on order 239. Okay, I think we're ready, Ashley. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Oh my God. Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Order 239 passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. And before we adjourn, I'd like to ask the clerk to please read orders 240 through 246 into the record. Order 240, 22, 23, approving residential parking for Islanders, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Order 241, 22, 23, accepting and appropriating United States Environmental Protection Agency Brownfield Assessment Grant of up to 500,000, sponsored by Daniel West, city manager. Order 242, 22, 23, adopting development program for Portland downtown for fiscal year 2023-2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee. Order 2024, 20, order 243-2223, establishing maintenance and implementation assessments for Portland downtown for fiscal year 2023-2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee. Order 244-2223, approving agreement between City of Portland and Portland downtown for fiscal year 2023-2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee. Order 245-2223, approving the amended wage scale to the collaborative bargaining agreement with the Police Benevolent Association, sponsored by Daniel West City Manager. And order 246, 22, 23, approving the amended wage scale to the collective bargaining agreement with the Portland Police Superior Officers Association, sponsored by Daniel West, City Manager. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Councillor Rodriguez with a second from Councillor Ali, and we will vote to do that. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yay. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chavarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.